Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to another edition of the Dad at Arms podcast. I am your host, Dad at Arms. I also go by Colt. And with me today is a really fun guest. We have James Etock here with us. Hello. Today. Oh, sorry, I jumped in there, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you're just fine. Sounds great to me. I was so excited. Um, I was like, oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, James, why don't you go ahead and, and introduce yourself and kind of tell us who you are. Okay. I'll... I was going to say, I'll, I'll keep it short, but I, I've got a, a kind of um, reputation for waffling. But uh, yeah, so my name is James Etock, um, born in merry old London in the UK. I don't reside there at the moment because uh, it's one of the most expensive places to live in the world. <laughs> but uh, aside from that, um, yeah, just a huge fan of He-Man and She-Ra, um, been a part of the community for, God, since like late 95. Um I've been fortunate enough to uh, contribute a lot to the community, un unearth a great deal of behind the scenes material relating to the original toy line, the car, you know, the cartoons, the mini comics, etc. Um, and from 2001, December 2001, till about now-ish, I've kind of worked on the brand officially on and off. So for like, yeah, just over two decades on and off the brand. So I've, I've worked on, uh, I worked on, I think my, what was my first gig? Oh, I worked for Mattel. That's what, I said. what was my first gig? Oh yeah, I worked, <laughs> I, I worked on the, um, the 2002 cartoon. They, they had the writers in place, Dean Stephan, uh, a couple of the classic writers like Michael Reeves and Larry Dottilio. And they wanted just basically a, uh, uh, an encyclopedia to the, the filmation series. So myself and another guy, Zadok Angel, who um, had created the He-Man and She-Ra episode view website. And that website catered quite uh, an audience and a reputation. We um, we were contacted by Mattel and they were like, you're the cartoon guys. Do you want to write this encyclopedia and get paid? And it's like, oh, that's the magic word. Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's so funny when I look back. But, you know, I was I was 24 at the time. You look back and you think, oh, my God, I was <laughs> I was so underpaid. But it's, you know, it's like, I think it was it was probably about two and a half months work of going through every episode. And yeah, granted, that's not hard when you know the series as well as Zadok, Zadok did and I still do. We could go like, oh, that episode, that episode. But you were writing about every character in every episode, every artifact, every location, every and creating like, I've still got it to stay, this HTML encyclopedia, like jumping back and forth through all the things. Gave it to Mattel. Their writers used it as like a foundation, which is why you know I remember them Mattel contacting us and saying we need we need a bio for Evil Seed and one for Count Mars. And we're like, oh my god, you're putting Count Mars on Evil Seed for the series, and one for Hordak as well. We're like, oh my god, you're doing Hordak. So exciting <laughs> back then as well. So yeah, wrote these um, these bios, and uh, yeah, <laughs> first disappointment on official He-Man work was um, Mattel. I still got the emails. Got all those years ago. Like, yeah, you'll receive an on-screen credit as, um, I think they were going to call us historians. It's been a while since I looked at the email. But it's either historians or research. And the, you know, the first three episodes were put into, like, an animated movie. Yeah. And luckily, yeah. I got to see it. And the credits are rolling. And I'm like, yep, any minute now, the credit's going to pop up. Any minute, James Etock and Zadok Angel, here we go. Any minute now, any minute. And then the Mike Young logo comes up. And I was like, oh, man. Uh -huh. Message Mattel. Oh, um. Our name appears to not be. Oh, we forgot. It's just like <laughs> Jesus, really. Um, and then a few years after that, I got to work with um, Val Staples and the MV Creations gang on the um, uh, comic. I, I worked on the encyclopedia, which was a disaster because uh, I, I barely written anything. I, I was I was writing and discovering a passion for writing, but back then writing wasn't my forte. Mm -hmm. And Val had said, "Oh." You know, I was a big fan of the old Marvel Universe comic books, which were these like encyclopedic, I guess, but, you know, who's who, you know, page A, B, C, you go through it, it's like Angel, B, C, all these different characters throughout the Marvel Universe. It was like they did the 1982 version, the 85, the deluxe 89 edition. It was really, really fun reads, and they had, you know, abilities and powers and the history. So I said to Val, wouldn't it be great we do this with all the characters from Man? And, and then it became a thing where it evolved into the 2002 show. So we were, we were going to do that. So I had all this background information and started doing it. And I was pretty atrocious at writing back then, as in I could write, but I uh, structure and it wasn't sure, very, sure. very good. 
and it was edited the hell out of understandably by uh, Leanne um, then Shaw who's now Leanne Hanna um, a dear friend <laughs> bless her we still joke about it to this day I was, I was using the word uh, traverse in like every profile and it became <laughs> to the day to this day where I use it now like on my YouTube videos there's almost like a little wink if anybody <laughs> if anybody's watching and knows I'm like oh she's used traverse again <laughs> but um <laughs> Yeah, the, the, that encyclopedia, I think one issue came out, and then there was a whole like kerfuffle with Mattel, so issues two to five just remained shelved. I was just like, oh, that's a shame. And then shortly after that was where it kind of snowballed, where I got the um, I got the gig to work on the UK He-Man DVDs, which was the first digital release of He-Man. Got hired as a co-producer, DVD commentator on that, so I did those. Then that led to the American... Uh, box sets the bci ones well that was like fantastic got flown yeah. over to san diego comic-con oh my god got to meet that was the first time i met lou shimer met Pr bruce tim paul dini that was what i always i always call that the uh, peace in the middle east moment where you had dini paul dini bruce tim and lou shimer all kind of just chatting and i was like oh my god i never thought because <laughs> dini and tim had been very vocal in like we hated filmation it's like you may not have enjoyed your work, but you know, or you may not enjoy looking back, but we all enjoy what you guys did. And it's yeah, just, yeah. I've, I've always had a bit of an issue about that. I think if anybody comes up to you and says, Oh, I love what you did on He Man, if you, if you didn't like it, don't turn around and make them feel like a dick. You know, sure, it should, sure. you should be like, Oh, thanks, man. Like, even if you're, it wasn't my greatest thing, but I'm glad you enjoyed it, you know, or like, it wasn't my greatest thing. Check out Batman the Animated Series, you know, that right, kind of, right. you know use it as a way of guiding people. Be, be, gra be graceful about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Be graceful. But uh, Deanie and Tim weren't exactly known for that. But yeah, seeing them with Lou Shine was awesome. And that, those two years we did San Diego, San Diego Comic Con were, were fantastic. Um, got to meet, you know, so many He Man and She uh, people, like, um, even like M Michael Reeves, who just passed away the other weekend, who worked on the Dragon Invasion, a bunch of, mm -hmm. God, loads of 80s cartoons, very like Dungeons and Dragons. Oh my God, so, so, so many cartoons. But I met him, he was there, Mark Scott Zickery. Um, yeah, meeting Lou Scheimer, Erica Scheimer. Um, that was fantastic. And then what came after that? Then, bizarrely, I got hired to, I mean, I'd worked on all the BCI DVDs. So that was like everything from Black Star to Brave Star to. Formations, Ghostbusters, Defenders of the Earth. It was it was it was like every BCI title that they had in their okay. library. So I was I was working all all of those. So that kept me busy for a good few years. And then Andy Mangles, who was producer on a lot of those, like for the the content, hired me to work on Time Life DVD box set for the real Ghostbusters. And that was probably one of the greatest experiences of my life. You're like you working on a DVD box set is the greatest experience of your life. It's like no. <laughs> I, I was, you know, when you look at what happened, it was, we'll fly you out to Los Angeles. Okay, put you up in a hotel. Okay, great. And you'll be part of like the whole interview process. So we got to, like, everybody came in that to, to pretty much to be interviewed for that set. So I got to meet and become friends with, like, to this day, like Maurice LaMarche, who was the voice of Egon Spengler and the yeah. brain from Pinky and the Brain. And is. Yeah. The go-to voice of Orson Welles as well, which is really, really crazy. I was watching a clip of Ed Wood the other day, and I was like, "Oh, it's Maurice Lamarche doing his doing his um, Orson Welles voice. It's, it's crazy." Um, what else? Uh, yeah, Laura Summers, the voice of Janine. She she and I chat very frequently. Um, all these writers and producers and animators and artists, because Real Ghostbusters is still one of my favourite shows. He Man and she are Real Ghostbusters right below it, and. During that trip, Andy Mangles was writing this um, beautiful book about Lou Scheimer's life. And, um, yeah, he, Andy was like, uh, I'm interviewing Lou today. Um, I'm going to go, you know, do you want to go to his house? And I was like, yes. <laughs> so <laughs> it, was, it was the most, I mean, it's an incredible, it was like, so you drove, it was in this area called Tarzana. And... It was literally like you're driving up, you know, almost like if you've ever been to Hollywood and the Hollywood Hills, it's just sort of like all these expensive houses get more and more expensive the higher you go up the hill. And then we're, we're, this was in Tarzana, so you're in uh, Los Angeles in the valley kind of thing. Um, and you, 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 you're going up and up, and then there's just this huge gated door, and you're, uh, you know, Andy and James drive up, like, and just this 
I mean, it was, I think, he, I don't know when the house was built. I think it was like in the 60s or so, probably in the 70s, because it was once Filmation were like hugely successful. And, you know, Lou's house was just so like just utter class throughout. And it had like, you know, the this pool, like swimming pool, that was like two or three tiered, I forget. The house was two or three tiered. Yeah. But also it, it was like, you looked, and it wasn't like a status thing, but you looked down on every other house. I think the house, I, I last saw it was valued at around about six million. So I was like, oh, it's probably wow. the most expensive house I ever went to. But the view was incredible because it was of, of the valley and you could just see like endless, just forever across Los Angeles. It was just so perfect. I was like, oh my God. And Lou was such a gent. And I, I've always told the story. There was like, I've met Lou a few times and he, you know, he never really knew my name. He did that time, but before he'd always because we'd only ever met him at conventions and he'd always be like british guy and i'm like yeah i'm the british guy <laughs> and, and john callis when uh, i mentioned to you before john callis was like oh, not that guy again <laughs> and john would be like hi so we, you know and lou was so lovely he was such a such a you know awesome human being and um yeah it was it was it was really weird when i um i got to meet him and i was coming back from uh, that trip I was like oh I didn't get a photo with Lou I forgot to get like I met Lou we went to lunch and I forgot to get a photo with him and it's just that thing of like it dawned on me a while later when I was when he passed away in 2013 I was writing like a, a eulogy I was like it's because when you're with Lou Scheimer he didn't make you feel like you were with Lou Scheimer you were just with a guy with a friend, and he yeah. treated you like you were the important one and it's like, but you're awesome. Lou Scheimer. You like yeah. changed and influenced generations. You know, it's um, it's crazy the influence he and like everybody who worked on those shows had. But he was just so kind of down to earth and funny. And my friend who lives out in Los Angeles, uh, Lee Clevenger, who's the, the guy who got me into collecting animation art, um, he went to Filmation's premises when they were closing down in '89. Mm -hmm. And he said he, he walked around. He was the one who first like started getting in touch with Lou Scheimer. And um, yeah, just uh, he uh, he he bumped into Lou like all the time in Los Angeles. And I thought that was so cool, just like yeah. meeting him. But yeah, from so I did that. That was that wonderful trip. Then I went back to working on. I think I did some more DVD stuff. There was an anniversary box set, I think. Then I got the gig of working on the official He Man and she a youtube channel that was a lot of fun then I, I actually walked away from that gig it was it was a lot don't worry it was, it was really really good fun. it didn't pay great but um it was you know i got to make official videos about yeah. anything yeah. i wanted um and then i, I walked away from that because i was just like oh it was, it was too much work i was really kind of burning the candle at both ends and then yeah i was uh i dark horse had done the art of he-man book and they sent it to me and said what do you think I sent it, they sent it to me a bunch of others but specifically me emiliano and josh van pell i was a part of the paragona foundation at the time okay and like like this uh, company that basically archives and you know digitally archives all this he man and shira production material and they approached us and said like do you want to take a look at this book and i looked at the filmation section and it was written by tim seeley and i was like with all due i, I know tim and I was like, oh, man, I said, I think I could do a better job of this. So I basically said to, you know, Dark Horse, do you mind if I, you know, rewrite rewrite and restructure the entire section? I'm like, go for it. So I did. And that gave me a credit in the book, like, as you know, I think I'm crediting like the cartoon section or something. Mm -hmm. And then then I worked on the mini comic books. So I had this unpublished mini comic. I submitted that. And then, um, yeah, then Dark Horse said, look, you know, You've done this unofficial guide, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, just just unofficial, just pictures, text uh, of every episode of the cartoon. They said, how about an official one? I was like, oh wow. I said, well, I've got most material ready. Yeah. And Dark Horse were like probably the best company I've ever worked for because you know they're Dark Horse. I remember buying their Alien comics and their Predator comics yeah, and their yeah. Robocop versus Terminator comics in the nineties. Mm -hmm. I remember buying all that stuff. They're Dark Horse. They know what they're doing, but. So they submitted their first kind of here's our here's our idea for a layout, and I said and I was like how do I you know I looked at it I was like oof, so I went back to them I said look I said you guys you know all respect in the world but I said I think you're approaching this the wrong way I said 
you you guys are used to making art books i said this is a guide then an art book i said mm. so there needs to be structure in they were kind of doing like you know uh, a full page spread of like a a, a, a grant uh, an image and then like a huge bit of text here and a tiny and i was just like it was it was all over the place so i said look can i can i send you like a design guide and i like they were like yeah sure go for it they were so responsive and i just sat there one evening and i whipped up still got it just there whipped up this i gotta say wicked design guide where i said present the episodes like this if there's a uh, a cell with a corresponding storyboard keep them together and da -da 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 -da, structured like this da -da -da, did all that sent it off they sent me back their next version and it was like it was i'd say 80 percent me and 20 percent them and it was just perfect i was like that's yeah. it i said that's that's the layout and they were just they were just so lovely to work for every every step of the way just so you know easy so easy to work i'll be like oh you know we need some can you just proof this i proof it and be like oh these are the edits they even to the most silly thing where i thought they're not going to make those changes because that's just and they'll be like yeah we'll make those changes i was like okay the next um so yeah that was that was the uh, the books i'm sure i did something else and then like the most recent thing was last year when this german company uh yeah. play on yeah got in touch and said we're doing he-man and on blu-ray um can you help out i was like yeah sure so and that was they were wicked they were so good because i said look it's, it's crazy um so i i back in the 90s when the community first started becoming something myself and this guy zadok angel created the he-man and she episode review website and as i mentioned before it's a place where people came and you know it was very much a um kind of a mecca for if you like the cartoon here's everything we've currently got about it and yeah it was it was the place to go and during the making of that website i'd recorded all this information that was kind of pointless but also you know like i'd record i'd, I'd gone through episodes upon episodes and listed you know this is where Linda Gary, these are the credits where Linda Gary's name is misspelled as Linda Gray. These right. are the credits where, you know, Tom Teller and now it's his misspell. So you can batch them and you can figure out, okay, I can figure out how these, then you look at the video releases. So back in the 90s, I'd created this almost like master list and said, here's how things are structured. And the age of digital, you know, when Hallmark had remastered the series back in the 90s made, or put it digital they'd made it pal so it was faster they'd um and during that process like a few intros had been lost a few bits and pieces had you know ended up in the wrong place so play on sent me all the, the episodes and i said okay i said but i want to restore the episodes to as close to they were when they were produced to the point where most people won't care <laughs> but like, I, I was like, I wanted those first, oh God, how many episodes was it? 18. So there was the first 18 episodes of He-Man. It's not the first 18 as in 1 to 18. Right. It's like uh, MU4, then MU3. It goes all over the place. But it's the, this initial chunk. I always call it the um, the sticker album chunk. Because okay. if you look at that Panini sticker album, yeah, those are yeah. the earliest episodes. And I said they have a different filmation logo. It's, it's the blue like the blue and pink logo, then you've got a different set of end credits. And I thought, are they going to, again, I've still got this documentation. I thought, are they going to go for this? And they were like, yeah, yeah, of course. And I was like, oh my God. And they were, they did it with She-Ra. Cause I said, like, I said, looking at your, your episodes, all of She-Ra's second season has the wrong logo at the beginning and the wrong end credits. And they're like, yeah, what do you got? So just that, that set came out better than I expected. And it's just, you know, people are like, oh, but it's in German. It's like, People didn't fail to understand. And I get it. I get it. If you, you don't, I mean, I, I say I get it. You should know the basics of a, acquiring a license. But the reason this wasn't available around the world is that when you acquire the license to something, if you want to distribute it to the world, you've got to pay a hell of a lot more for that license. Or mm -hmm. like Play On, you're like, we're a company that exclusively distribute in Germany because that's how we make the most profit. He's shipping that book, um, the book, that box, it's as big as a book, that's why, and it's on my bookshelf. <laughs> shipping that Blu ray set would cost a fortune. There's no way they could do that and make a profit. So 
yeah, they had to kind of limit it to Germany, and you know, people wanted to get it there to go through other websites. But yeah, I, I, it was like one of those moments where I thought, oh, God, that came out really bloody good. And then the other thing I did was uh, something called the Return of Faker, which was, I mm -hmm. guess, has gone in and out of my career since 2014. I guess oh, it's been nearly 10 years since we started the initial ideas that's crazy but yeah that, that's that's another thing and i think that's pretty much everything i've done <laughs> <laughs> even though you just said introduce yourself i was like well no that's know. perfect you <laughs> skipped a good chunk of the questions i had prepared for you with all that so <laughs> you nailed it um i did want to ask about a few of those particular yeah. projects um with the uh with the return of faker you said that started kind of back in 2014 yeah what like that how, how did that what was the impetus for that for you and and it was funny was um like going back and looking at that stuff a few years ago i was like oh my god i forgot how these conversations first came to be so we were I mentioned before uh, i was working on the official youtube channel and the guy who was my boss um had said to me you know you've got carte blanche to do whatever you want on the channel and i was like wow that's awesome so i could make videos whatever i mistook that and it's my fault as carte blanche as you can do whatever you want so i was like oh so i spoke to uh dushan mitrovich who's like um like i would call him a colleague who's a big fan of all this stuff and he's just like a wizard when it comes to editing and doing some amazing stuff and he'd done stuff like over those years of working on the channel with me he'd done stuff like you know i'm sure it's like some pact with the devil um He'd done this thing where he would extract all the vocals from episodes not for all of them because you couldn't do it with all of them but for most of them so we had all these like vocal tracks for a bunch of he-man and she-ra episodes it's like wow you can hear the you know the actors just saying their lines you know as in the dialogue's just coming out there's no music or effects mm -hmm. so he did all that and i said so I, I i've I still got all the messages and i said to him like in passing i said oh wouldn't it be cool if we did something for the youtube channel where we just have like a fight, like a five minute fight between He Man and Faker, just like, just like fight. Because He Man can punch Faker because he's a robot. So <laughs> we can get away with it that way. So we did this, like, and it started off like that. And then, but then it built and built the idea. But in, like, once we came up with that idea, I said, oh, I'm going to do like a little teaser trailer. So Dushan like traced a few little images we created like a little mod, um, a character model for faker so we had something to work with and i uploaded this little teaser and said and called it like new cartoon return I, I don't know if it was called return of faker it was just something anyway put it up and it was doing like really well on youtube i was like oh wow this is you know i mean that, that channel we had so many lot i think we had a lot when i first got on there we had about 13,000 subscribers. When I left, we were about 60. It was crazy. We had gone up a lot. Yeah. So, yeah, I um, the video was doing really well. And then about a day later, the video had gone, and I was like, what the hell? And my boss at, um, at DreamWorks, Stroke Classic Media, as they were known, um, just basically said, like, what are you doing? And I was like, I, uh, we thought it would be fun to, like, make a He-Man card. So he's like, no, you can't do that. And I was like, oh. I, was like, I thought we could just make like a an unofficial cartoon on the official channel, like just something for fun. He's like, no, because there's all these rights with regards to voice actors and music and this. And I was like, oh, wow. I said, I completely misread that. OK. And then that kind of started my thing of, oh, well, I want to do this. So I might just leave the channel anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, myself and Dushan were just like chatting. And the, the faker idea just it started for it being like, well, he man's going to fight Faker. Well, what happens if, like, he's got to go, he's got to fight for a reason. So how about Orko's being captured at Snake Mountain? So, yeah, he's got to, So well, maybe we can show Orko being captured. Oh, maybe we can show Skeletor, like, building Faker. Oh, what about this? And what about that? And it just built and built. And then, you know, I, I've, I've always told the story. It's funny. Like, with, um, with animation, usually script comes first, then storyboards, then animation. With this... Um, the storyboard was the script because I was like, right, we need a scene with He-Man, Man-at-Arms and Teela in the hangar bay talking about how they're going to get to, like, how they're going to rescue Orko. Mm -hmm. 
So my brain, when it comes to the cartoon, is quite encyclopedic. So it's like, oh, right. So well, in that episode, he says this. And in that episode, he says that. So if I can do this and edit that. And like I said, Dushan had created all these vocal tracks. So just that I just started cutting stuff up. And I was going, that sounds like a conversation. I'd sent it to a few people just like, does this sound like an actor? They're like, oh, my God, what's that from? And I'm like, we just made it. You know, just there's one scene in The Return of Fake, which one of my favorites is, he man and Tila in the wind raider having a conversation, flirting with each other. <laughs> and it's all in it. The, the dialogue is from in, in this, I'd say 45 second window of dialogue is 11 different episodes, but it's, it's pieced together. So it sounds like an actual conversation. Wow. And it was just stuff like that where I was like, Oh, Tila does say that. How about if I use that in a different context, but with the same delivery and how about, you know, it just, and so the, the, like I say, the storyboards happened and then like, or like the idea for a save and the storyboards and then the, the, I'd, I'd figure out what dialogue would work and then we'd animate to the dialogue. Um, and yeah, it started off as, oh, it's probably going to be like 10 minutes. And it's, oh, 15. Or what about if we do this scene, you know, 20 this scene 25 oh no we've just got we've just created a 31 minute he-man card so um and yeah the end result was like i remember watching it on my um my big screen telly like dushan had finished the file and sent it over like so we go back and forward i was like you know we, we'd have arguments and stuff and it, the end result was fantastic but when he sent it over i sat down and watched it i was like i was nearly in tears i was like holy crap we did it we created like a new episode of he-man and then obviously we were going to show it at PowerCon, and um, even though Universal were well aware of it, um, I understand from their point of view, like a month before, they just randomly said, you can't do this now. And we're like, but you knew we were doing this. What's changed? Mm -hmm. And there's there's been a few things said by people I know in the industry um, without like name dropping or anything. Because I couldn't figure out like why Universal had left it so late and decided to suddenly do it. And I appealed to Universal. I said, look, I said, take this from us. Make money from it. Do whatever you want. Like release it officially. Release it unofficially. Put it on the YouTube channel. Just do whatever you want with it. Because we made it for people to enjoy it. As we called it in 2018, 2019, we were saying, this is our love letter yeah. to the filmation cartoon. Like the first credit on the end credits is dedicated to Lou Scheimer with the there's Lou Scheimer's signature. Sick, That's yeah. how much it meant to us. And yeah, um, they, they didn't bite. They said, oh, we're having some discussions. And that was 20, J July of 2019 was the last time Universal told me they were having discussions. And mm. it's been a while. So yeah, uh, power kind of everybody was like, are you going to show it? Are you going to show it? And we kind of got a way around of showing it. And I recorded the room's reaction to it. You had like, I think, I think Val Staples said it was roughly like three or 400 people in that room. I know three or 400 is a big jump between two, but it was, it was something crazy like that. I think 300 is amazing. Yeah. And when it finished, like the cartoon got a standing like ovation. And I, wow. I started like, like nearly crying. So I was like, Oh my yeah. God. I was like, we made this for fun. And like it, 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 it touched people. And it was just like, that's because what the thing, you know, the thing that people often, get wrong about filmation is oh it's this or it's that or it's lacking this or it's like that it's like okay whatever but at the end of the day that show was all about heart mm -hmm. it was like family and so when we you know made this cartoon that was always in our mind like the moral segment is so beautifully delivered it's from the episode return of evil but it was so applicable to the return of faker because in the, re the re return of evil episode Tila talks about Today, Orko was, Orko was, was it something to, um, uh, to, I sang about like a, an evil robot and talking about an evil robot. And Orko was very frightened, but Orko overcame his fears. And I was like, oh my God, we can use this for the return of Faker. It's so yeah. perfect. And you use it, it's Linda Gary's delivery and her beautiful like dialogue is so warm and kind. And that kind of ends the episode, you know, and then credits crop and credits roll. And people just got up and I was like, wow. And, and yeah, people like go mad. And, um, and then the following day, you know, or it might have been the day before, it might be the day of, but like Kevin Smith's at the convention. Everybody's like, what's he doing there? Yeah. And then they announced revelation. And then I, I, I don't want to like, you know, it's, it's pretty a conspiracy theorist. It's like, there was no moon landing or whatever, you know, <laughs> but people, uh, certain people in the industry were like, you know, that it was probably a decision that wasn't universal is that we don't want, people getting confused 
which is what was used in the in the letter to me in the, the imagine like you announce a new he-man cartoon at powercon on the sunday people coming away from the show are talking about they saw a new he-man cartoon right. return of faker and people are like but you no, no, there's a new He-Man cartoon. So, you know, I, I, can, I can appreciate that. But then what immediately throws that off about brand confusion is that, what, two months after they announced Revelation, the CGI cartoon was announced and everybody was right. like, well, there's two new He-Man cartoons. Yeah. So it was kind of, yeah, it's, it's one of those things. It's like, look, we made it. Um, Rob McCullum is doing this documentary, Fake Information, in which it will hopefully be shown. Um uh, yeah, and it's it's one of those things where I'm I'm proud of it, and I think in time it will be. Ce- this sounds very um, arrogant, but in time it will be celebrated as like a lost episode. I've yeah. already seen. It's funny. Someone linked me to a video yesterday. I said it was like 50, 20 greatest villains from He Man, and someone was using clips from the Return of Faker that some oh, wow. uploaded to YouTube, and it was just like. Yeah, in the episode, Faker was that's just like that's not that's not fact. This is an unofficial cartoon, but <laughs> right, it's like right. it's it's out there, and that's what I mean. We we did such a good job that people believe it's part <laughs> of it was, the. It was actually yeah, because <laughs> people were saying like afterwards. I mean, it was it was crazy, man. I remember um, <laughs> blessing Pixel Dan like um, as I was like reeling, Pixel Dan jumps on stage. And I think the I think the audio's out there. It's amazing. And he just went. <laughs> he might take this back now, obviously, but he just went. Um, he goes, look, I don't care whatever Mattel do next. He was just like, that is He Man. He goes, what <laughs> we have just watched is He Man. He goes, yeah, it's something like whatever they do, whatever they try. He goes, that is He Man. I was just like, thank. You. I mean, it was it was lovely. He did that. And like, I've known Dan for years, so it, was, it it meant the world. And you can tell it was coming from a really like genuine positive place mm. um but yeah it was it was um it's crazy it was like quite quite the journey but it ain't over yet that journey because obviously like I say rob mccullum's doing fake information i think that's going to be a beast unto itself and i mean that in a positive way it's like i don't know where that journey is going to go but um yeah we'll, we'll get there in the end and i think um yeah it's it's going to be a crazy few years i think but it's, I, every time i keep thinking like oh it's i think i'm kind of done with my journey through he-man in terms of official unofficial work whatever it's just like oh now i'm doing something else to do with it right. you know, I, I always seem to get pulled back in in some way there's like a godfather godfather <laughs> two or three line in there somewhere <laughs> but yeah no that idea of uh you know talking about the brand confusion it reminds me of the story i've heard regarding the uh the comic of the He-Man Ninja Turtle crossover comic that they, that was in production that we've seen the art art for. Is that Freddie Williams did the art. Williams, yeah, yeah, yeah. he did right. the art for it. Um, but there is some talk surrounding that project that the reason it was ultimately canceled was to because it was too confusing with all the new He-Man content with Revelation and the CGI show coming out that it would be too confusing to of for fans to mix up the continuities or or something along those lines and so that's the reason that that they that i've heard as to why that project was cancelled and yeah, yeah I, kind I, of I kind of I, I kind of buy into that um yeah just but like at the same time i don't believe it would have created brand confusion yeah. I, think, I think fans are intelligent enough to look at a he-man ninja turtles crossover and keep it in that yeah you know box like right. you do with anything. It's like we've seen He-Man fight Superman. We're not confused. We understand yeah. that that story took place then. It's like, yeah, you can... One of the things I mentioned doing the encyclopedia when, you know, for the 2002 cartoon, the, the comic book, um, at one point I was talking to Val Staples, we were going to do like a vintage encyclopedia. And what it was going to do, I still got the documentation from God, 2002. And... Val wanted me to create the ultimate continuity using mini comics, every story, like all from the 80s, storybooks, mini comics, cartoon. So everything, including like the Savage stuff. I think, no, actually, I had to eliminate the first four mini comics because they you couldn't tie those in because they are so far removed. But like the Mark Texera mini comics, those Gary Con, Mark Texera, the seven DC produced mini comics, the three issue limited series, the Superman crossovers, 
filmation cartoon. I, I managed to create like this continuity. It was going to be like this really epic tale of you could talk about you know Prince Adam and how in the early days of his adventures he had to run into the cavern of power, but at some time uh, after the you know the two halves of the sword were reunited, he gained the power of grace. Was able to use the sword to mark. It was all this crazy stuff we were going through. But yeah, that was that was where you were bringing things together, kind of you know forcing it to a degree. But I always thought it was fascinating to be able to do that. But yeah, like to say brand confusion, I feel like I feel that's a stretch. It's to me that's more. This is what we're focusing on as a company right now. This is the IP we're focusing on. Right. Um, we don't really want anything connecting with that. And so I think at that moment, uh, Revelation was the be all and end all of, of mm -hmm. Mattel. Mattel and Netflix's vision. And obviously, you know, you had the CGI cartoon, which confused people even more. And then the Origins toy line, the Masterverse toy line. Like, I, these days, I, I get so lost. People go like, oh, have you seen the Masterverse figure for this guy? I'm like, what? I, when did that happen? And it's, it's crazy, but it's, it's kind of cool in a way because there was a time, I remember I used to buy Wizard Magazine and Toy Fair Magazine, mm -hmm. especially Toy Fair, whenever they'd mention He-Man, I'd like if I was going, I was in the comic shop going through. I was like, "Oh my god, they mentioned E Man!" Like, especially during two thousand, yeah, oh, yeah, two thousand two. They promoted like I think Trap Draw one figure of the year or something, and I would cut out the pages. I, I think I've still got somewhere all the clippings from I got from Toy Fair, even in there, even like in the I think it's Wizard. No, it's Toy, Toy Fair or Wizard. I think it was Wizard would do their price guide in the back, like the back okay. pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there yeah. was a. Yeah, they always have these images and they have captions sometimes. I remember like one of them was, um, they were talking about Shazam. It's like one of these little things that said, it's just like the episode of He-Man when he had to use, say, the phrase back. Because I was like, oh my God, someone mentioned He-Man. It's crazy to think back then, anytime He-Man was mentioned or something, I was like right on top of it because I would hear about it and I wanted to. These days, it's, and it's, not, it's not like a change in attitude at all. It's just... I don't know, like I've, I, I always say like, and I don't mean this disrespectfully to anybody who collects the news. I always look at it as, oh, my He Man and She Ra happened in the in the eighties. I'm fine mm -hmm. with that. I really, I love the new adventures. I really enjoy two thousand and two. You know, anything beyond that is like, oh, I can, I can take it or leave it. You know, but I'm fine with that because you know, as a, as a fan of stuff, I just like, uh, I've I've always been in this community. You can go back to the like. <laughs> The earliest days of the community like in 95 and all i've ever wanted to do is just celebrate he-man and she -Ra and not show off but just show demonstrate my love and try and get people on board be like you know back in the 90s like this problem with power episode it's really cool you know everyone should check it out that's why we did the yeah. episode review website you, you you're showing people episodes they may have never seen at the time some some of the others we'd never seen before um and you bringing people on this journey and just and like we've got to meet Rob Lamb in 98 or he contacted us and said, Oh, you do this website. Here's a bunch of behind the scenes, you know, the, the Masters of the Universe series Bible I got from him. The, um, the first like storyboard online, the first, Oh God, all the, all the firsts we put up online was crazy. Even like heroes, son of He-Man. I put that on my, the series Bible on my website back in, I want to say 2000. Because my friend Lee Clevenger had gone to Lou Shimer Productions and just pulled out this desk and gone, Lou, what's this? And he's like, oh, that was a pitch we did with, um, uh, I think it was Deke they were going for in 96. And he goes, it never really went anywhere. And Lee just sent me the whole thing. He was like, you've got to put this on your website. And I was like, oh, my God, like, heroes, son of He-Man and the Master Universe. Okay. Put that up. People lost their mind. It's um, Power of the Evil Horde, the Bruce Tim painted record book i shoved that on like it was, it was crazy all those kind of and it was it was such a, an amazing time back then to do stuff nowadays i'll do things and it will catch like uh there'll be some traction and then about a week later someone just copy and paste it and remove my name i'm like okay well i guess that's the world we live in now yeah yeah unfortunately <laughs> I, I saw something like um i think it was about a year or two it was just before revelation had happened i created this graphic of like five He-Man, it was Filmation's He-Man, uh, Filmation's yeah. initial He-Man, mm -hmm. then the Filmation He-Man, then the New Adventures 2002, and then the Revelation model. And I put that graphic up and I put it on the exploding background. I said uh, something like History of He-Mans or something like that. And I put it out there and that, that did a lot of traction. And then about a month ago, someone said, you realize someone's like 
redone your image and i was like oh really and i looked at it i was just like god it's just it's so silly because it's like what does this person this person saw my image and was like i'm gonna do that but my way it's just like okay well i guess you know it's flattery in a way but they're clearly doing it because they want that you know right that pull of like look what i did everybody and it's like yeah that was nice when i did it three years ago but that's that's just that's the world we live in now you know i've, I've seen like i say the return of faker gets used in clips on youtube where cartoon experts talk about he man and she and it's like <laughs> you go for it you tell me all about you tell me all about you know film um filmation he man and she you know right. top top uh top like uh stupid moments in he-man and she and it's like that's not even in context like i don't, I don't know <laughs> and i love don't get me wrong i love poking fun at he-man and she that's one of the the beautiful things about working on the official he-man channel i was able to make videos that mock the show so i'd like what silly things that i did i had he-man's he-man doing the, uh, the trick from temple of the sun where he rubs sand so fast he turns it in a glass i had him do that and his hands catch fire I was like, that's a really cool visual. So it's just the, the clip ends with E-Man going like, ah, his hands are on fire and this giant crab, uh, no, sorry, scorpion, like looming over man at arms. And that's how the clip ends. I had another one where E-Man, like, there's this episode, Search for the Past, where E-Man, like, is catapulted onto this floating island. I thought, oh, well, instead I'll have him miss. So he misses and then Skeletor and the Basher, like, sh flies into him. <laughs> and then I did that joke uh, like a, a few clips later where I was like, I'll do it again. And Skeletor was like, not again, and flies into a mountain and explodes. So that's, that was the good thing about working on the official channel. They allowed me to do like that, that silly stuff. Um, so yeah, I've always, I've always loved, but that's the thing. I think people think, you know, I'm, I'm known as like the filmation guy. And I think people think, oh, you, you think it's, <laughs> I remember one guy saying, oh, that's all you care about. You think it's perfect. I was like, no, I don't. That's why I gave episodes like, two out of ten if i thought yeah. it was perfect everything would be 10 out of 10 of course i don't right. think it's perfect is it my preferred version of he-man yes but as i've said numerous times like some of my favorite stories are those seven dc mini comics by gary con and mark mark texera they're amazing those mm -hmm. like those are the those are the first mini comics i remember like when when he-man arrived in the uk i don't remember ever seeing the first four mini comics the savage ones I remember the first mini comic I looked at. I still got the memory. It came with Beastman. It was uh, the Power of Point Dread. I remember just being like, "Wow!" It was that. I always remember that. Loved that wicked panel of Triclops and Man at Arms. Like it's a, a long panel of them dueling with their weapons. It's like, yes, yeah. it's, it's just so action packed. And that mini comic was so so cool. Didn't really appreciate the art at the time as a kid because I was like, I was big into comic books. Um, even as early as like 1982, 83, I was, I was like huge into comic books. Um, I guess I, I was reading some real, I was like fans of like Brett Blevins and John Byrne and some really kind of unique artists. But yeah, those, those mini comics um, were so, so great. And they're, they're my favorite, that's probably some of my favorite stories to this day. But you get, you get some fans online who are just like, this is the only thing He-Man can be. And I was like, the beautiful thing about He-Man is you should be able to, pick and choose yeah. i've always said that's one of the things i love about it it's like i one of my favorite things that's not in any of the canons like as in filmation never did it um dc comics never did it um i don't think the mini comics did it i'm trying to think what other golden books uk annuals whatever but the ladybird books had this I think the star comics did it briefly but the ladybird books their thing one it wasn't the sword of power it was the power blade which i always thought was like that's such a cool word i, I prefer yeah. sword of power but power blade was a nice term turn phrase and it was the thing that only the heroes could wield it so in one of that's the right. i think it was the iron was that i said that, that's right i remember that now yeah the the iron master mini uh, uh, ladybird book was about skeletor creating a creature that could grab he-man's sword of power yeah. And like, you know, then He-Man commands the power of grace. Oh no, no, they, they, it's a big, oh God, that book is so beautiful. Big storm and like the lightning strikes the, the, the Iron Master and he just he melts. But <laughs> I, I love that whole story of just them not being able to, it was only the heroes could wield it. In the, right. the star, the star comics went one further and said only Prince Adam He-Man could wield the sword. Not even Orko or anyone could, they, they would like get a shock or get, you know, burn their hand or whatever. I love that and I love 
I love the fact that New Adventures of He-Man did an episode called You're in the Army Now, where Prince Adam is put on trial for defecting during battle because everybody thinks he's a traitor. That's like, I was, I see that. It's like, that's a He-Man story. That's how you deal with the secret identity. That's such a great thing. And like Adam's on trial, he's found guilty. And he has yeah. to go to jail. That's like, that's a great episode. And he has to obviously, you know, as He-Man prove himself innocent. But I remember the, the way that episode is structured. And that's, that's the, again, the beauty of He-Man and she is I think there's, there's good in all of these things. And I don't think it, it you should like, some of the savage stuff, the Alcala stuff, I adore. I don't care for the stories in those first four, but the artwork, um, a lot of the stuff Alcala did that followed. Just found, I've got some original, I used to have like 30 original Alcala pages, but I own like a bunch of Alcala pages. I love his work. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, just there's so much to love about He-Man Shearer. And I think, you know, it's the fact there's all these different interpretations, canons, whatever you want to call them, is almost the strength of the brand, the franchise. You know, she is more limited because she's only had a few. But with He-Man, it's like you're spoiled for choice. Like, what version of Horde do you want? Do you want the uh, do you want the cartoon version, the blue skinned one, or do you want the grey skinned one, who's probably more like more evil? Or mm-hmm. I mean, I say that the cartoon one did steal a baby. You know, <laughs> it's um, it's pretty evil. But it's, it's that thing. I love that ability to, you know, look at Clash of Arms and think, this isn't in the same continuity as the cartoon, but I bloody love it. And it's, I mean, Clash of Arms, what a mini comic that was. I mean, it was, I always say it's like, I'm sure it's the mini comic that was the most produced because it was it was with Clawful, Webstore, Jitsu, Fisto, <laughs> with Clash. It's like, not the Clash of Arms again, but um, it's, a, it's a great story. I love that. I love that mini comic. Yeah. No, and I agree with you. I think that's one thing that I always try to, to express to people is that you know the good thing about he-man is there's something for for everybody to enjoy and if you don't like this certain version well there's five or six others you can pick from yeah you know, it's and... like the um the 2002 cards and i think that's the the biggest shame at the moment in this in the community i guess is that the 2002 cartoon i don't think gets enough love right Be- I think the toy line was very obvious. I didn't care for the toy line at the time. I love the four horsemen. love what they did. Like, in terms of especially what the four horsemen did with classics is still my favorite toy line. I love those Mm -hmm. sculpts. I love the designs. Yeah, four horsemen's work on classics was, to me, works of art. But the 2002 cartoon and those stylings were very, you know, we were all coming out of that 90s where everything was big, like big swords, big axes, you know, yeah. very, very anime inspired. Not there's anything wrong with that. But it was coming out of that that uh, visual kind of style. And so the toys, I think, are a bit dated, uh, very almost like very static as well in their poses. You couldn't really do much with them. You go and, you know, you go and look at that cartoon. That cartoon is bloody good. There's a few things, you know, hit and miss. But for the most part, that sh- that show, probably in terms of consistent storytelling, is probably the best He-Man cartoon. Because it, it's, in terms of like, because it's so, what, 39 episodes. But that first season is so perfectly structured with like little moments that all add up to something. Even yeah. like the introductions yeah. of characters, you've got like, oh, Count Marzo and the Giants and Evil Seed. Oh, they're, they're characters in it. Oh, my God, they're all going to team up. You know, mm-hmm. fantastic. And it's such a shame that cartoon doesn't get more, you know, um, more coverage, more love. I mean, yes, it's long overdue a Blu-ray. But, yes, yeah, it's, it's just a shame there aren't more, more people talking about because I think it was a very, very, very good show. Yeah. Do you have a... Uh... Of, of all these multiple projects that you've worked on, do you have one that's that's kind of your favorite? I'd say probably it would have to be the animated adventures book for Dark Horse because I always said that that was, I think I said it in the introduction to that book, that that was the book that I was kind of like destined to write. Mm. You know, when I go back, it's so funny. I remember being in a comic shop with my dad around about 90, I want to say 93. We're in a comic shop. And my dad was like, at the time, big into Star Trek Next Generation. So I didn't care for Star Trek, but he would, so he would watch it. And 
um, because he would come in from work, he'd ask me to record it. Like, you know, you can't always guarantee the timer on a VHS right. recorder is going to work. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'd come home from school, and it, assuming I was back home from school in time, which I usually was, I'd, uh, you know, I'd start recording. Sometimes I'd even try and edit out the adverts for him, although that sometimes backfires where you press pause and forget to press unpause. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> So uh, good news, I take Star Trek, bad news, you only got the first quarter of the, <laughs> the episode. <laughs> but I, um, yeah, it's just, I'm actually just remembering that as I said that. I was like, oh yeah, I did that. Uh, actually, my, my worst offence ever was, um, oh God, I really should make a video on this for my YouTube channel. <laughs> uh, I, um, my dad's friend in 80, oh, I want to say 1984, yeah, it would have been 84, he had, bear in mind, you know, as, as you pretty well know, back in the 80s, a movie would come out, it would take years for it to get a VHS yeah. release. And, and even then, you couldn't buy it. It was probably just rental. Mm -hmm. And and, and to, when, uh, uh, to appear on, I remember like Ghostbusters took, I think about four or five years just to air on TV. It was available to rent on VHS. You couldn't buy the VHS tape, so it was crazy. Star Wars, I think, was even more protracted because it was such a huge kind of franchise. So I think it was like 84, my dad's, my dad's friend had a copy of Star Wars, like a bootleg, like, you know, pirate copy. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, as a kid, I, we had a VHS recorder very early on, like, the, <laughs> bizarrely, the first thing I ever recorded to VHS was uh, Battle of the Planets, which is this um, cartoon, uh, westernized adaption of, um, uh, adaptation of, uh, Science Ninja Team Gatchaman. So I was a big fan of that show. So it's like the first thing I ever recorded was an anime. It's really bizarre. But we had like a VHS recorder very early on. So I was taping He Man as best I could. And obviously, you know, my dad had been watching Star Wars. So I just, He Man Temple of the Sun comes on. Like the episode just starts. I press record, play and record. You know, the old top loader. Yeah, yeah. Play and record. And I'm recording, and then, you know, episode ends, stop, rewind, and I rewound the tape to watch it again, and it rewinds, but then it goes back even further, and I'm not thinking about that, and I start playing the tape, and up goes the Star Wars text, and I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. You know, as a little kid, I remember my dad going, oh, God, you taped over Star Wars, and I was like... <laughs> Yeah, I taped over Barry's copy of Star Wars. <laughs> so my, my dad had to give the tape back and be like, yeah, my son recorded 20 minutes of He-Man over. I always remember where it was as well. It was right where um, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're, you're only, you know, she's a hologram, Princess Leia. Mm -hmm. And then it just cuts to He-Man. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure that's the message Princess Leia was trying to put out. But, uh, but yeah, so unfortunately I didn't get to watch that episode for a long time after that because that tape went back to, my, uh, to Barry. But um, oh, where was I? Well, I, was, I, what, I can't remember my trail of thought where I was going before that. I was talking about something before that. Recording. <laughs> oh damn! It was I was I was making a point about something, and then I went on. I went into a tangent that I knew <laughs> I might not come back from. <laughs> recording. Oh, I forgot what it was. <laughs> well, it, it reminds me. Well, I'll go off on my own tangent because it reminds me. In, yeah, sure. In college, this was back before the BCI DVD releases had come out. You know, and I had a I had a few of the uh, the VHS tapes that I'd found in uh, in thrift stores and stuff like that yeah. of He Man. I was like, man, I really want to watch this show again. You know, as as a young adult, you know, now that I'm not a kid anymore, but they just weren't available anymore anywhere. You know, you can. And so I went on eBay, and this was the early days of eBay because I remember I paid I mailed a check to the guy that I bought them from, and that's how I paid for it. You know, yeah, because it wasn't through PayPal or anything like that. But I got the entire series that had been recorded on VHS and then burnt to DVDs. Right. And so they just came in the really thin jewel cases and stuff like that. And so I remember sitting with my roommates and we were just watching old He-Man cartoons, but it had all, you know, whatever commercials would come on at the time when this guy was recording them on his VHS, you know, they were burnt onto these DVDs and, so that's how I revisited He-Man for the first time was, wow. was that way. It's just yeah, such I mean, a different time. Well, it's 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 crazy. Even even like early nineteen ninety six seems like a lifetime ago. But that was when. Uh, so, like I say, the community had started late nineteen ninety five. But you know, I I had I had recorded seventy two episodes of He-Man on VHS in the UK when it was broadcast. So I'd seen seventy two episodes. 
But back then, we didn't know how many episodes there were. You didn't. Mm -hmm. The information just wasn't there. So that was one of my first tasks was when I started creating these websites because I. Zadok and I created the He Man and She Wrote episode review website in 90, I think we started there in 97. But in like late 95 and 96, I was creating like James E. Talks He Man and She Wrote website, just very bl bland, very, but it was, it was me starting to accumulate knowledge. I've still got some of those old HTMLs. It was me just going, you know, because then we know what this episode is. And I was just like putting lines of dialogue out there and seeing, you know, people be like, oh, it's that episode or this one. And then um, I found Larry, Larry, you know, late great Larry Dottilio. I got in touch with him and I said, you know, I said, oh, my God, you're the Larry Dottilio. And we started, that's how our friendship started. We started chatting. And I said to him, um, I said, how many episodes of He-Man were there? And he was like, I was 130. I was like, oh, fantastic. Well, okay, we've got a number. But I've only got 72 episodes. So um, this guy in America, Scott White, had taped most of the series on, um, from the USA Network. And I had all these vague memories of, like, House of Shakoti. I never, I'd never seen the problem of power. Um, I'd never seen certain episodes. Evil Seed. I'd never seen that first time around. So he sends me this tape at the beginning of 1996, which I've still got to this day on my shelf. It still works. And it was in like SLP, so it was like you know super long play. So it was like quality wasn't great. It was still good, but it wasn't obviously great. And he had nine episodes, nine or twelve. It was nine episodes. It might have been 12, actually, regardless. And I remember just putting it in. I came home from work, put it in, and just watched it. And I was just like, oh, my God. And I was seeing these episodes that, in some cases, had never seen, or in most cases, hadn't seen since, you know. It sounds weird to say, like, that was 96 to say 10 years earlier, because that was, like, 86. And that was sure, just sure. 10 years before. And now it's, like, a lifetime ago. But, yeah, it was, it was crazy, those those early days. of t we used to, You know, we, we used to tape trade. That's what we did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's how we built up, like, you know, so I, 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 in the introduction to my book, I, I listed as many people as I could remember, who were like part of the episode trading community, because not only were you trading episodes, like I was building up the episode guide as I went. So it's just like, I remember it got to the point where there was like two episodes to go. And I was like, oh, we need to find out what these last two episode titles are. And I said, I know what one is because I remember watching it as a kid, but I don't know the name of it. And then that last one turned out to be Trouble's Middle Name. And I was just like, oh, it turned out to be one of the crappiest episodes of the series. But I was just like, oh, <laughs> great. I got to, you know, we got to get there in the end. But yeah, that whole, um, yeah, that, that voyage of discovery was just, I mean, it's, it's, it's long gone. I mean, although I, I always do say this and believe this. Um, sorry, I just accidentally clicked my mouse. I always say this and believe this. What I, I've always loved about being a fan of He-Man and She-Ra is that, Whenever I think, oh, there's nothing more about the vintage line or vintage cartoon, you know, as in the old, the 80s stuff, that, you, that is, there's nothing to be discovered now. Something else comes along and you're like, oh my God, I've never seen this before. Like, you know, when, when I discovered the um, unpublished Terror Island mini comic, I was like, oh my God, I found this unpublished mini comic. It's like, does anybody know the history of it? And like a few people, well, oh, nobody did because I spoke to the writer and he's like, I've got a vague recollection of writing it, but you know. Um, you know, the unpublished issues, 14, 15, and maybe 16 of the Star Comics. It's just like all this stuff, filmation stuff to this day. I, I stumble upon stuff, random artwork, and be like, oh, my God, there's a deleted scene. Or, you know, and it's it's. I've always loved that, that you can still discover new stuff for, mm -hmm. from the 80s, from that property. Yeah. And it's just like, oh, that's so cool to be able to do that rather than, Oh no, we know everything about that. That's done. It's just like, wow, there's still more stuff to discover. Yeah, that's awesome. It's been, it's been like I say, it's it's, it's a, a wonderful, um, yeah, wonderful experience of doing that. I just, uh, yeah, I always I always smile when I think about, it. especially those. It, say, it sounds like a, a scratched record, but those early days of the He Man Shiri community was, was really fascinating because you really were finding out so much about something you. It was because it was, you. I remember, like, I've, I've told the story before, but my, my dad came out from work and said, I've got the internet. And I was like, Oh, that's for weirdo. Because this was this again, this was like October 95. And I was like, That's for like weird. Although the first time I'd ever seen the internet reported on was in a hip hop. Because I used to be big into hip hop, like, mm -hmm. you know, the early days of Wu Tang and uh, when East Coast rap was East Coast rap and like Souls of Mischief or East Oakland, California. I was like huge into all that hip hop scene. And 
um and so i go online and yeah there's this magazine like i said before i went online this magazine was the first place i'd ever seen an article about the internet saying the beastie boys have an internet web store and it's like what is that you yeah. can buy stuff and the first thing i ever searched for on the internet was this hip-hop group called souls of mischief like is it going to be anything about they had like a bloody website in 95 with merchandise shirts lyrics and i was just like oh my god they've the, Souls of Mischief. the next thing I searched for was He-Man and there was only one website and it was this guy Kevin Herbert and I always remember that name and he he just had all it was cause again this is 95 it was just text and it was just his memories of these toys and characters Ram Man what a fun toy that was da, 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 da. then Adam Tyner's uh, website which was run off his old college server well his college server at the time uh, maybe it was his uni server regardless it was um you know, it was what became He-Man.org. Mm -hmm. It was just this website where I, I I contributed reviews, like a paragraph of text, like, Happy Birthday Roboto is a very fun episode. Duh, 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 duh. <laughs> and it's it's so funny to think that was, yeah, like I say, all those years ago. I mean, it's, you know, a bit, a bit, I've been a part of this online community longer than I was when, you know what I mean? I was a fan of He-Man and mm -hmm. She-Ra. Mm -hmm. And then... Yeah, I've been I've been a part of the community longer than I was that initial fan. It's it's crazy. It's just like wow, where did all those years go? <laughs> but yeah, I was I was kind of you know I never get too despondent about stuff. Um, if I don't connect with the most recent figures or cartoons or whatever, I'm like oh no, but I still I still love this stuff and I'm happy sure, that people sure. love what's coming out. You know, it's like I said to you before we record, it's like I I'm not a fan of Origins or Masterverse, but then. If they brought back, you know, I love the classics toy line. If they brought back classics tomorrow, there's no guarantee I'd buy all the figures anyway. I've sold most of my classics mm -hmm. recently. I still love those figures, but it's just like, oh, I, don't, I don't need to own them, you know. And I think that's, right. I think people, <laughs> five years from now, people will discover that about Origins and Master of Us. I don't mean that disrespectfully. They'll be like, oh, yeah, I was kind of caught up in that. I must collect everything until yeah. Yeah. the line is ended. It's just like, because we've all been there. So, uh, kind of I spent all that money. Um, but yeah, I, these days I tend to, you know, I collect animation art and behind the scenes material just because I think that stuff has, not, it's not about value, but there's there's like, you know, educational purposes. I've always, I've always found that part of he man Shira fascinating to be able to say to people, oh, look at this and look at that and just, yeah, bring that to the masses. It's, it's Going back to the old episode review website, it's so funny when you think about that. It's like, you know, we, we had audio clips. You'd have like a, a paragraph. You'd have a review broken up into paragraphs of text. And, you know, at one point in the text, it would be like a little highlight, hyperlink. You click on that, you get a little audio clip from the episode. It was just it's such a different, like, yeah, thing. I wrote um, like a, a little a retrospective about the episode of your website when it was, I think it was when it was its 20th anniversary in 2018. As in, I know the, the, the website's long dead. But it's like, oh, that was 20 years ago we did that. So we did this little, uh, you know, retrospective. And it's just like, wow, it's just writing about it and people remembering. It's just like, oh, that was the, every Saturday I'd, we'd update the website. And, like, that's what I've tried to continue on with the um, with my YouTube channel. The whole point of that is I, I, want, I want people to come become, like, almost reliant on, oh, it's it's he's going to update that channel every Saturday with a new video. It may not always be at the same time because I'm always playing around to see when people best connect right but i always want that thing of like oh i want i want to put out content that people go oh yeah he's going to put something out on a saturday and a wednesday saturday and a wednesday saturday and a wednesday so yeah it's it's that's like i guess my new way of, of um yeah uh putting and en entertaining putting stuff out there and saying like hey did you see i'm just like uh, before we um we connected i was doing a um i, I wrote a script for and started editing about two weeks ago like a video about the star comics the marvel okay. star comic yeah and it got to, I, i'd written this script and i was like oh my god this i recorded the the audio and i was like this is going to be about a 30 minute video i was like oh i can break it into two halves so i thought like not because it's like oh i can get more views it's it's a case of no it makes more sense because the first half is this comic is atrocious issues one to eight <laughs> And then issues nine to 13, it's just like, I mean, I know what happened, but like what the hell happened? There's such a dramatic right, shift. Right. 
and it's because they got a new writer on and he was just like i'm gonna respect this and it's just it's that shift is crazy so i thought what a great two-part thing because the first part is and it's very you know i did i scanned in all the star comics in stupid high resolutions i restored the image to my best of my abilities i started editing the video uh, last week and i was kind of polishing off the first part um the sea uh, this afternoon this evening i was just like oh this is i think this is going to be uh, people are going to really enjoy this you yeah. know pointing out the phrase crumb bum and just how the dialogue is so atrocious like man i'm <laughs> man i'm saying to hordak oh yeah ugly says you <laughs> that doesn't sound like man at arms or, or snake face snake face saying to hey man um uh what is it you bet your sweet potatoes it's like you bet your sweet potatoes snake face every every villain comes off as if they've, they've got the same voice and it's bad and it's crazy like you get to issue nine with the hate stones and the whole thing changes and it's it's been such a fun video to make because yeah it's, uh, th that's the other thing making these videos as well uh, I said to you before we recorded it's it's quite therapeutic but it's also yeah it kind of just inspires you to do more I that's yeah. the best, best, best way of putting it it's like i'll do yeah. do a video and it's just like oh i might do it. it's like I, I i work you know i try to work ahead of schedule as best i can so i can always update every saturday and i'm, I'm constantly ahead of schedule but i've started going stupidly ahead of schedule as in this doesn't mean every video is completed until this point but I, the other week I recorded an episode commentary that won't go on the channel until January 2025. Mm. So assuming the world still exists by then and we haven't <laughs> been blown out of a, you know, existence, <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, yeah, so my, my commentary for January the 7th, 2025, that's all ready to go. Oh, so I'm kind of working ahead like that. And it's just, sure. uh, yeah, because I, I think, you know, you work ahead, you take the pressure off yourself and that you can enjoy what you're doing. So I, mm -hmm. I didn't say this, but when I did the, um, I've said it publicly before, when I did the, when I worked in the um, He Man and She Ra BCI DVDs, that went from, oh my God, this is so fun. Um, because, you know, going to San Diego Comic Con, you know, being invited to that, being, a, being at the booth, drawing and signing was amazing. But the amount of work that went into those season box sets, because there was four in total, was it was such a it was a, it became a nightmare because what happened was i was working to us i mean i often work to us time but at the same time i was doing my day job so i was working oh, in the okay. dvd production house so i was i was designing dvd menus and doing various other things and then and storyboarding as well for corporate film so i was doing that during the day then i'd come home from work have dinner and then work for bci until mm -hmm. like two in the morning get a bunch of sleep wake up go to work and it was just i remember just just being so i couldn't i remember for about a year after i couldn't watch he man and Shira, which is crazy but I was just like i i've watched so much putting those dvds together i'm just i had to check out for a year and that's i think she timed it well because that's when the real ghostbusters box set came along so i was like oh i've got okay. something else to watch for a change <laughs> but yeah it's um yeah it's, it was crazy but yeah i've been really enjoying the youtube stuff i ideally i'd love more eyes on my videos but then i guess who wouldn't on youtube but i, sure, I think it's sure. yeah it's just why I, I think it's a natural thing but i think in time i think more people will discover my channel and be like oh wow he's he's doing good content and then hopefully go back because that's what i do whenever i discover a youtube channel i tend to do a deep dive and go oh let me see what else they've done before mm -hmm. um and yeah i mean I, I i started off strong on my channel and it's just like if people go back they'll see some pretty good content but yeah we'll um we'll see what happens but i mean i'm enjoying doing that at the moment and then there's the odd kind of official bit of work for he and Shira that's still kind of on the horizon and i'm not actively pursuing it at the moment but there, it's out there and it's just like oh you know I'd, I'd like to work on it again, but at the moment, it's I'm kind of enjoying all the YouTube stuff. Just like I get mm -hmm. to talk about Spider Man, his amazing friends, and the Hulk, and you know, much maligned Popeye and Son, or whatever. You know, it's just all for these sure. different shows that I have such a passion for. And I think when it comes from that kind of uh, mentality or that kind of perspective, you know, it it gives it authenticity, and you can you can you know, I can sense the passion that you have for it just by watching your things and that's like that's that. it in a nutshell like that's the important you, know, part. you can you can go on online and see 
top 10 villains of He-Man and it's someone yeah. and don't get me wrong you're allowed to make those videos mm -hmm. but don't come across as if like you know oh I know the series so well it's like who appears in episode 32? That's Merman <laughs> and the Kraken. You know, I'm not saying you need that level of nerdness, but when, when someone's making that video portraying that they have that kind of knowledge, it's like, oh dear. I remember there was one video I saw that someone linked me to the other week and they'd literally just taken dial like lines of text I'd written either. I don't know what I'd written it for or something, but I was, I, I heard this woman talking doing the voice. I was like, that's my, I know how I write, you know, yeah, it's, it's yeah. crazy, but I, don't, I didn't check the video, but I, was like, I doubt I get a credit in it. But it was, um, it was, it was so funny. It's like, wow, just, I guess people do do that. It's just like go online. I understand it in terms of research, but at least if you're going to take a chunk of text, maybe like make it your own. But then, sure. you know, plagiarism and the internet, you know, they kind of they go hand in hand. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, like curses. But yeah, I think as the, the hope is with my YouTube channel is that it's authenticity, it's passion, it's yeah, it's, it's really nice, like, when you get, you know, Larry Houston messaged me today, and he was like, just, just he promoted the channel, and, you know, it's like the Master Universe, you know, one of the prominent artists on the mini-comics is, like, someone who loves my videos, because he worked in the animation industry for G.I. Joe and Amazing Friends and so many other cartoons. It's like, he watches and enjoys my videos, and it's like, sometimes it's like, oh, I could have a million views or i could have larry houston saying right. he likes my videos and there's 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 something very yeah lovely about there it's like huh i guess i'm doing all right if yeah that yeah. guy's saying i am yeah yeah no and that's you know the main reason i do this is like i said before like i want to know the answers to the questions that i have about certain aspects of things but i have my day job you know i i'm a freelance writer with multiple clients that I work for. And, and then I farm, I run a family farm. Oh, wow. And uh, so I'm, you know, I'm busy, but it's seasonal work. And so this has been a great way to keep myself busy during the off season from my farm work, you know, and because it's a passion project, it's something that I can set aside for a few months out of the year and then jump back into it and dedicate some more energy to it. And if I'm not, if I'm not focused on generating a large su subscriber base or a large viewership, you know, it's always something that I'm going to have there waiting for me to enjoy because yeah. it's, it's not something I rely on as a job. Does that make sense? No, no, no I, I get it. I get it. It's, you know, I, you know, you might, you, you do your channels and you know, the dream is, Oh, I, I want like hundreds of thousands of people watching my videos because, you know, I believe they're that interesting or that worthy. Mm -hmm. But the truth is you can't do it for yourself, not in a selfish way, just because that's, like you said before, that's where the authenticity comes from. It's just, I want to do this because, not because, like I say, if I started doing, that's the thing, like I could, I could probably get so many more views if I start, you know, using clickbait titles in my, my videos. Yeah. You know, instead of, let me think, like, I'm trying to think of a video I've done. Instead of like, um, so my, my, my video about the star comics, I thought it was a somewhat witty title. I was going to call it uh, To Catch a Falling Star because it's all about how this comic, you know, He-Man was kind of on his way out in terms of like the success of everything. The star comic was, and, and this writer came in, he was trying to save it. But if I was, in, if I was, I was going to say intelligent or sensible, but yeah, if I, if I was exploitative, I'd probably call this, you know, uh, is this He-Man's worst comic as a video title? Right. And people go, oh, we'll click on that. But it's like, I, I want to be able to look at myself in the mirror and be like, exactly. oh, no, I, I titled the videos as I want them to be. As people go like, oh, you know, it's He-Man, it's about the star comics. Let me see what he's got to say. Rather than, you know, the sad truth about Ninja Turtles. What's the sad truth? Yeah. There is no sad truth. I just used it as a title to draw you in. And, yeah, that's that's that could be on me but at the end of the day like i say i can i can go like no i'm I'm titling these videos the way i want there's no clickbait people are watching my videos because they want to mm -hmm. so yeah that's um yeah that authenticity um and love for what you're doing goes a long way but i was i had to smile when you're talking about your, your farm work um i knew very little of farm work and then um my friend like i said who i ran the he-man and she-ra episode review, review website with zadok angel 
he um his he had a was you know his family owned a farm in mm -hmm. um I guess it was Otselic Valley in New York, which I mean, I think of New York and I think of Manhattan, but obviously New York right, is a big right. place. So Otselic Valley is this uh, small town outside of, obviously far outside of, uh, <laughs> far away from Manhattan and stuff. <laughs> and um, yeah, he ran that family farm. And in the early days of us communicating, because, you know, you couldn't just send videos on the internet or do a, a call like this. Mm -hmm. He... Um, we, we sent each other, like, I think I sent him a VHS tape of, you know, filming myself talking, cutting to clips, you know, very archaic editing with VHS to VHS. Like, here's a clip from my favourite Brave Star episode and play a clip and did it all the way like that. He sent me one back. And his one was such a culture shock to me because he was like, you know, here we are. My place is, you know, here's our farm. And I was like, oh, he's, oh, he runs a farm. His family runs a farm. And it was like a family, had, you know, the, the I think the farm is now run by someone else but for at least i think three generations it was in the family and it was so fascinating because i was like the the discipline and the amount of work that went into it, i could not believe i'm like this guy's i think he was 16 at the time when i first met zadok online and he was like he was like straight a student he's um he went to harvard he's now um like a talent agent in hollywood like a legit wow. successful talent agent um, he knows uh, Ted Biaselli very well as well because obviously they <laughs> walk in the same circles. Sure. And yeah, it's it's crazy. Like he was seeing how much effort he had to put in working on a farm, like getting up at the crack of dawn, the cows. The I was just like, oh my god, there's so much. I remember just thinking, like, how is this guy able to function? Because it looked like so much hard work. But I guess when you're raised in that way. Mm -hmm. you're kind of it's it's if it's a part of you then you just yeah do you know what I mean? maybe not raised all the time but like if that becomes a part of your life then it's it's second nature yeah. but to uh, like a city boy like me i was like what you know what is this <laughs> i thought milk just turns up on the shelves in the in the drugstore or whatever it's just like you have to i mean i understand it comes from cows but the amount of work that goes into that it's just <laughs> God, it's phenomenal. So yeah, when you when you mentioned like you know a farm, it's just like bloody hell. I, I flashbacks to seeing all that <laughs> that hard work. Yeah, no, I mean, it it is a lot of hard work, and I do have the benefit. You know, it is a multi generational family farm that I grew up doing this kind of work with my father, and and now oh, I have wow. the opportunity to raise my children in a similar way, and to be able to pass on that work ethic, I guess, to them. Yeah. That, that I was taught. I mean, that's something that I wouldn't trade for anything, you know. Yeah, no, I was yeah. going to say it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good and strong work ethic. That's for sure. Yeah. At least from what I saw with Zadok, it was just like <laughs> bloody hell. And he still had time to, you know, review He-Man episodes and stuff. And I was like, you're crazy. Just you know, literally wake up, do farm work, go to school. I guess he was sixteen. You go to school come home, do farm work, <laughs> do like some He-Man and She-Ra shenanigans, like whether it be, you know, reviewing episodes or writing something or the other. Um, then, yeah, then repeat it all for the next six days and then for seven days. And then, you know, it's just, it was a, just, a, uh, just a process. And I was just like, wow, you've got to have such, and obviously, like I say, it's, um, it's, it's so funny how careers, I always, I always laugh. It's like, he's, there's a part of well, I mean, Zayda will sometimes message me and be like, "I love that you know you you kind of turn this into your 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 job and everything." It's like, dude, I'd happily exchange careers with you <laughs> right now. You know, you're you're happily married. You've got a um, you've got kids. You've got this uh, lovely lifestyle in Los Angeles. Um, and don't get me wrong, earned every single penny, but it's just like mm -hmm. bloody hell. That's uh, and and there's me still writing about he-man and she -Ra. but it's that thing that's like I, you know I, I i joke about it but it's like i i love i love what my weird career has become you know i, I went freelance in 2001 i've been freelance pretty much ever since yeah and it's just um yeah in that it's funny because when when we started the episode review website i was like i, I, was like, I hate writing and say look it was like say it was at harvard he was like, oh, my God, he goes, he goes, you'll love it. And I was like, no, I said, I don't, I don't want to review episodes. And I look at those early reviews, and they're just they're rough. 
but I just I had no interest in writing. And then Zadok was the one who was at Harvard. He was doing English literature, and he basically taught me the love of writing. It still took me a few years to adapt to actually being somewhat proficient as a writer, but it's so funny to look back. I've said to him before, it's like without him, I don't I don't write for a living, and that's yeah. a really strange world. I was like, I was very much wanted to. You know, it was a very young kid. I wanted to illustrate for a living. Then I realized very, probably my early teens, I was like, oh, I think I'm better at coming up with ideas than actually illustrating a comic book. And then I realized storyboarding was my strength. I, I went like, I spoke to a few people. And like, oh, no, no, you can storyboard. Um, it's so funny when I do, I don't do it all the time, but the pandemic, I had quite a bit of work. But when I do corporate, <laughs> when I do corporate storyboarding, so many of my corporate storyboards look like an episode of Filmation's He-Man. <laughs> because because what the, the beautiful thing about that is Filmation, you know, people are like, oh, the animation, this, and it's like, no, but the best thing about Filmation's He-Man was it was so well staged and directed. Even though there was a lot of repeat, you know, re animation reuse, you were able to really understand the 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 screen, you know, mm -hmm. work into a screen. So when I do storyboards, I'm doing like that classic, you know, I'm um, trying to do it on the screen like He Man close up kind of thing, <laughs> you know, like head turn like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of, but you, using all those little tricks and it's, um, but yeah, I send the storyboards off and I don't tell them that's from a He Man episode. Like, well, the sto storyboards are really strong and it's like yeah, that's pretty much you know Taylor's stock walk into shot or whatever. But it's, it's not me, I'm not tracing. I'm just saying like my 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 visual inspiration is totally sure, from Asia. Sure. And a yeah. few anime and stuff, but it's it's funny how, yeah, that like I say, and you go back to, you know, the the greats who some of them lo no longer with us, but that worked on this brand. It's um, yeah, I just remember like not to go into a whole thing, but just I remember the excitement of just getting a new He-Man figure, and I was still one of my strongest memories. So our local toy store is this uh, little toy store in Enfield, uh, in London called Jennings. It's just down the road from us. And it was, I mean, I would. I wish I'd taken a photo inside Jennings. Like walking inside a toy store and, you know, spending money on camera film to take one photo is probably like a waste of money. But <laughs> I wish I'd got a photo inside Jennings because it literally it was such a small shop, but it was packed to the rafters with 80s toys because it was the 80s. But their main, like you, literally the shop was so, it was, it was, it was a long shop. So it was, it was, you couldn't fit more than like two people at a time walking along because there was like, you walked in, there was a counter on your left and on your right, there was a, like an, almost like an island, but you could, as a kid, you could walk behind the, the island display, but as an adult, you just knock everything off the shelves and the, <laughs> and the pegs. Right. But that island was just all He-Man stuff. And you know how oh. these things were back in the day. They were just, they wouldn't. They would just string them up, you know. It's just yeah, like they're not yeah. old mint on card. It's like, yep, yeah, string it up. And um, I remember just walking there and seeing all these toys. But I remember that. I remember that one day so specifically because you know these days people wouldn't have a clue. But back then, you didn't know the toys that were coming out until you walked into that toy store right. and you're like, what? And I remember walking into the toy store and seeing that that that. I guess second wave, you know, obviously you could divide him up to like one of those these and these ones, but it's like that second wave where you had Battle Armor He Man, Battle Armor Skeletor, Mechanic, Buzz Off, Fisto, Whiplash, Web Store, Clawful. I remember walking in and going like, oh my God, what are these? And I remember like picking up the Web Store card. I think the Web Store figure was the first one I bought and looking at the back, and I still remember this day, like looking at the back of the toy store, I, I, you know, all of like six, seven years old, whatever. Look at the back of this card. It's probably about this big in my hand as a kid, and um, and just seeing Battle Arm He Man, Battle Arm Skeletor, and the others. And I remember thinking, when I saw Battle Arm He Man and Skeletor, I remember thinking, oh wow, they've made them. I remember like thinking they've made them sci-fi. That was like my 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 for some reason I don't know why. I just remember thinking they looked really futuristic. And the funny thing is, it's it's obvious, but you look at those those card back illustrations from like Battle Arm He Man onwards, they're more they're more comic book in, in style than those initial card back illustrations where you had He-Man and Skeletor and Merman. They didn't quite look like the toys. Mm -hmm. The ones that followed had like bolder colors and looked more like the toys. But I, I, I really do need to record a lot of this in like into like a YouTube series or something. Cause my memories of He-Man show, <laughs> I remember being at school and the kid coming in going, uh, 
oh yeah, they've released the Prince Adam fi figure. I'm like, no, they haven't. Like, Stop <laughs> lying. And then literally the following day, a kid comes in with Prince Adam. We're like, oh, it's just amazing. Yeah. I remember drawing, I remember like seeing the figure and quickly drawing it with crayons on um, yellow lined paper. I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> I was so fascinated by that. But yeah, it's, it's crazy. I mean, like you, you look back at all those memories and it's, um, yeah, I, I, I love it. I really do. It's been, I think that's why, obviously, I've, I, you know, I'm, I made I made a career out of nostalgia, and I, that's why I love talking about the old stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and there, are, don't get me wrong, there's parts of me where it's like I wish I could have got more into Revelation. I wish I could experience what people get with Origins and Masterverse, but I get that in other ways. Sure, like sure. Whether, whether it be through YouTube production or going through animation art or speaking to a writer or an artist about the old stuff and being like, oh wow, that's amazing or whatever. It's um, you get your kind of joy like as we said earlier the the, the beautiful thing about he-man and she is especially he-man is you can pull from so many different things i love yeah. that i love this i love that and that's that's the way it should be i think if everyone was like that the the community would be a lot more understanding rather than what you like is rubbish i hate it i hate you and it's like okay well, <laughs> cool man that's uh, have a nice day you know <laughs> yeah that was fun <laughs> that's just the way it is yeah why do you think that that Masters of the Universe has has such a lasting impact? It, you know, goodness. Um, I mean, I mean, the, 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 when you go back to the earliest, like, or, or at least the initial toy line, it was groundbreaking in terms of in terms of both what the action figures represented and the cartoon, because people, you know, they go hand in hand. There's no doubt about that. Right. The cartoon right. was responsible for so much success as was the toy line but the the toy line was here the cartoon you know the facts speak for itself like the toy line is doing more than okay a cartoon that arrives becomes a phenomenon mm -hmm. i think because it was one of the first it always has that it had a worldwide appeal something like gi joe didn't come over here to the uk so we didn't get that we got transformers obviously and shows like mask and ghostbusters but and Ninja Turtles, obviously, or Hero Turtles. But we didn't, we didn't get, um, oh, but we didn't, we didn't get GI Joe, for example. So I don't think that's as popular brand, at least worldwide, as people would like to think. But yeah, He Man. I think, I think it was very, it was very nineteen eighties. I think you can still translate it into the modern day. And I don't mean like update it. I mean like I still think you can tell those same stories, especially the. The Mark Texera mini comics. I think you could bring those to life really well in the modern age with that kind of mm -hmm. the, the visual fancy element. I think there's a slight bit of confusion there because, as we've seen, the problem with He Man Shearer is that it's not connecting in the modern day, no matter how hard they try. You're not really creating a wealth of new fans. What you're finding more so than often, in my experience, is a lot of, you know, parents kind of saying to their kids, check out this stuff. And that right. kind of has a knock-on effect. But I don't think you're ever going to see that. That I don't think you can get that for any brand, really, that that kind of explosion of like, oh, my goodness, look what's happened. Here's he and Shira again. In the, you'll still get, and I think the internet has helped a lot with that, as in keep it afloat, as it were. Um, but I think the, the last in effect is just, I think those characters are timeless. And I think, I honestly believe that, long after we're gone depending on the state of the world and the industry the media industry i think you'll see that kind of original vintage you know origins style come back into play where they're telling dare i say like good old-fashioned comic book stories episodic whatever i think that that kind of will make a return at some point because i think there's and i, I it's very tricky to predict the future for Eman Shira, but i think I just think that that it it was kind of it was very timeless. It was very unique. You know, one of my favorite cartoons of the eighties is Mask. I love Mask. It's one of my favorite shows. But you look at it and it's like, well, I can understand why it's not it's not captivated as many people over the decades because it is kind of a bit of a mix up between Transformers and GI Joe kind of thing. I don't. I personally don't watch that cartoon thinker that it is but i understand that kind of criticism when you look at he-man it's and, and transformers they're so bloody unique yes transforming robots and barbarians have been done before but he-man just 
I think it it trend as soon as it, as soon as you enter pop culture, that changes everything. Mm-hmm. And I think you know, especially with something like Hey Man, I was I was um, on a pod for the fans of Power podcast the other day. We were just talking about the term He Man, and it's like, yeah, in the 1950s, it was such a derogatory term. You know, He Man, this, He Man, that. You're a muscle bound He Man. If you say that phrase now, He Man, it's only one. There's only one applicable thing now, and because obviously the previous generation probably no longer with us, kind of thing that that knew of it in, in a certain way. So I think, I think it's. I wouldn't necessarily. I wouldn't necessarily say it's the storytelling or the. The figures it's much more like the 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 vision of he-man and, and she-ra especially he-man has kind of transcended itself to become part of pop culture if that makes sense i you know obviously i love the stories i love the characters but you can walk up to probably numerous people probably even like i don't know as young as probably in their late teens early 20s and say he-man and they'll know they'll be like oh yeah i know of that and obviously, because of because social media has changed so much as well. Sure, sure. And, and what their interpretation of He-Man is, I don't know. But I, I do think, and I've, I've because I've, I've been around the community for so long, um, and like I say, social media has, has changed a lot of, of how that community is perceived and how it's, you know, how it connects. But I, um, I think there is a danger of He-Man and she just fading away at some point. But that's like anything, because... You know, if you're honest, He Man and She-Ra is not a brand like anything that Marvel have. Right. There's this, and you know, I know people always talk about the film, and it's like, look, uh, I my opinion has always been, I will only ever get excited when I see the first on-set photo, not when I hear about casting, <laughs> not when I see a director in front of a monitor, not when I hear about a script because I've I think I've read three movie scripts over the years. And bear in mind, we're going back as far as 2000, but nearly 20 years, this He-Man movie is being made. Mm-hmm. The, all, the, all the way back to uh, John Woo. John Woo, that was the one. Yeah, yep. John Woo. That was the days. first kind of, oh my God, it was on IMDb. It was like John yep. Woo, next project, like He-Man. It's like, John Woo's doing a He-Man movie. It's like, what's he going to do instead of uh, doves, though? Italian <laughs> falcons? You know, <laughs> loads of screeches as, he's, as, as He-Man's walking along. Actually, All that slow motion. Yeah, that'd be quite a cool visual, actually. Um, but uh, yeah, I just think the the thing about the movie is, um, I I think it's already too late for it. I think if you were going to, you were going to do a He Man movie, it should have been around about 2010, 2012, when that that superhero thing was reaching its initial peak. Yeah. You know, I've, I've, I've said before, when I first heard they were making an Iron Man film, I knew who Iron Man was. I read sure. the comics. But I was like, an Iron Man movie? Who's going to watch that? Because He was, he was C-tier at that time. He was time. C-tier. It was like yeah. the Avengers. You had like, you know, you think of the event, Captain America, Thor, Hulk. But even Captain America and Thor weren't known. Like, I mm-hmm. used to read Thor comics and draw them at school. And, and people would all, often ask, what's that? And it's like, it's Thor, God of Thunder. Like, what? So I read the comics. When they said they were making Iron Man film, I was like, that's going to be a disaster. They made a really bloody good film that started an entire wave of superhero yeah. films. So like, I've been yeah. waiting all my life for superhero films. Now, in a way, I can't wait for them to end. But <laughs> there, there was a there was a moment like up until about Endgame and um, probably Spider Man No Way Home, I was I was very happy. And then it's just like everything that's come out since. I'm like, oh, I'm not really feeling it anymore. But that just might be like. You know, I've kind of got all my. Once you get rid of Thor and Captain America, it's like, an oh, Iron Man. It's um, yeah, you've kind of lost me a little bit. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know what Thor is nowadays. When I saw, saw the recent Thor, I was like, who is this character now? <laughs> but um, but yeah, you know, I think He Man, a He Man movie should have come out. And they're obviously, you know, at um, San Diego Comic Con, I was at twenty fourteen. We met the then. Was it the there was were they brothers or this writing partnership? They were gonna or were they directors? Regardless, they were the next. They were the ones who were gonna make He Man. From they remember them like talking to us and going like, oh, you know, yeah, it's gonna be kind of hinting and it's just like, oh, this is all very exciting. And then, okay. then what I one of my friends, um, his partner is a writer, and 
he was approached to do the He-Man film in 20, I want to say 2015. And he described it as like a poison chalice because he was like, oh my God, I get to work on a He-Man movie. And then he was like, the reality is he wanted to do a He-Man. He wanted to write a He-Man movie. Mattel wanted him to write their He-Man movie. Mm. That's the problem. He was he he wanted to write the movie that he'd grown up with, not but like not saying like filmation cartoon, but as we said, you taking all those things. Sure. Bit of Savage, bit of Mark Texera DC mini comics, bit of filmation, maybe even New Adventures in a weird twisted way. Two thousand and two, cobble that all together, we might have something really special. Here. Mattel wanted, we need to create like remember that that point in time when everybody was trying to do a cinematic universe. I remember the, the worst one I heard, like, I love the properties, but the Hasbro Cinematic Universe, they wanted to do Transformers Visionaries Mask and G.I. Joe all in the same universe. I was just like, oh, my God, that I, I love those properties, but I do not want to see them all together on the big screen. Like Matt Tracker and Leoric, you know, Mask and Visionaries. It's like, no, don't do this. So, and and I think... I think what Mattel were looking at and what they still might be looking to do is just like, no, we're not just going to make a He-Man film. We're going to, we're going to do like a, an origin film. And it's just like, just make a film. And I think that's been the problem is, and I understand why that, but the impression I get these days is it's too many cooks involved. They all want to, they all want to leave their mark on Masters of the Universe. And it's just like, the, when you go back and look at Masters of the Universe over the years, the reason some of those old stories are so timeless is because people weren't trying to leave their mark. They were just trying to tell stories inspired by the greats of sci-fi and fantasy writing that came before them. Mm -hmm. Same with the real Ghostbusters. It wasn't like, this is me leaving my mark. It's just, I'm going to write shows to entertain. And I think the problem with Hollywood a lot these days is, you know, I understand it, but, you know, we've, we've got coming out what? Uh, Seth Rogen's Ninja Turtles. It's like, right. can't it just be Ninja Turtles? You know, but it's, right. oh no, Seth Rogen's made this show. And it's like, I wonder how much input he's actually had. But I understand because you put a, you put a big star Hollywood name in, it takes on a life of its own. But yeah, I um, I just, I, I don't think a He-Man move at this point would be timely. I think if anything, you know, you look at something, look at, you know, Ant-Man 3 has massively underperformed, right? Mm-hmm. It's been a disaster. You know, you look at the box office returns, it's like, you know, for a Marvel film that's kicking off phase four to do that badly, you're like, oh man, this does not bode well. Um, that's Ant Man. That's an established character that's had two movies behind it and has been part of this, if, probably the golden age of that cinematic universe, yeah. as in, you know, Endgame and all that. It's like, you know, it's, wow, well, Scott Lang and giant man and ant-man and you know all that great stuff and then making a he-man movie it's like where's the audience for that the audience is us sure but it's it's not as big as we'd all like to think it is and i think mm -hmm. that's i think that's the problem is you know i i would love to believe that like i said he-man is definitely a part of pop culture that doesn't necessarily mean it's huge right. it's you know and i think that's the problem it's you know <laughs> I mean, there was that one script doing the rounds and I, I saw a bit of it and that was enough where it was, you know, they were going to write the He-Man comedy movie where he's he wakes up, he's in New York, he's a businessman and he's suffering with amnesia and he has to get the power of Grayskull. And it's like, what? I mean, at that point, what are you even doing? Why? It's, it's what we say, you know, these days about some of these reboots. Why even call it that? Why even call yeah. it He-Man? You know? Yeah it's 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 weird so i i do worry for the future of he-man and she-ra but the, the thing i've i've said this is so self-congratulatory i guess but I, I always say it's like i was i was here at the start i'll be there right at the end man when sure. they're closing the doors on the internet i'll be the last <laughs> one going don't forget to watch episode 22 <laughs> <laughs> but you know what i mean i don't mean that as like a, a dismissal no, but... but i've seen so many people of the in the fa over the years coming to the fan base and when there's no toy line or when there's no cartoon just immediately check out and it's like i'm i'm here for the long haul and maybe that's a yeah. curse maybe that's a poison chalice of its own but i um i've seen brand managers come and go i really have sure. you know sure. um yes yeah, it's, it's it's nuts it's nuts I but 
yeah, I think it's one of those things where it's it's. I don't want to say it's kind of a niche property. Yes, you know? I agree. And because I remember, I obviously loved it as a kid, and so I would get excited about it and trying to talk to my friends who were big, you know, Batman fans or Superman fans, you know, these obviously titans of the comic industry and stuff like that. You know, I was like, oh well, you know, I like He Man, like, and trying to explain to them who He Man was, you know in comparison to their heroes, you know, it's like, well, yeah. this is, this is who I like. It's He-Man. He's a barbarian with a sword. He's kind of a superhero type of character, you know, but it was still pretty, you know, low key, not, not well known to the point where you would see an image of a, of a He-Man action figure on a list in a toy fair magazine. And you'd get excited because it's like, Oh, it's He-Man. Yeah. You know, they're, they're giving some attention to something that I feel like I'm the only one that knows about, you know, and so now we're kind of in this this uh, era the past few years where it feels like, I, you know, I think we have more He-Man stuff floating around now than we did when we were kids. Yeah, oh, definitely. There's, there's so and, much, like, I mean, we say that, but the amount of merchandise that was around in the 80s. Yeah, that's I, true. I mean, that was phenomenal. Like, to this day, I still see items pop up and, I'm like, that was, that was a thing? Like, everything from bubble baths to toothpaste mm -hmm. and you know, alarm clocks. It was something someone posted last year. I mean, on Instagram, I was like, that was a thing. Cause and maybe it's a case of what we, just what we had access to as kids, you know, yeah. what we knew existed is what we saw with our own eyes. Yeah. Yeah. So we had. We do. To, now we have the internet where we see everything as it's revealed. And I mean, I'd be, I'd be fascinated to, you know, cause origins are obviously surely going to start running out of characters soon. Mm -hmm. So you think like how many, how much, you know how 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 far can it really go? And I think you know with the right kind of thing, you can. I mean, I'm surprised. I mean, maybe I shouldn't be. Like, I don't know. I don't know what the cartoon rights are like these days. But they made a figure of Coldar. But you think the amount of cartoon characters you could include in Origins is never ending, and there is a demand for those characters, like sure. Shikoti, Mask. I, I realize they've been done in classics, but you think you could bring all those into origins you could have like a good two or three years worth of material but yeah. for some reason they're kind of doing this and i mean that has been their attitude towards the cartoon over the last few years and i understand i understand all these crazy rights things these days and yeah universe were a bit odd but um yeah i i you know i mean the original question was why is it why is it lasted so long and i i don't want this to come off the wrong way but I don't think people appreciate how strong the fan base has been over the years. Right. That 2002 cartoon um, was a, a legit reboot. That was them going, let's see if we can bring in a new audience. And they kind of did, but not enough. Like you still, the amount of people I encounter these days that say that was my first show are very few and far between. Most people I speak to obviously are either my age around my age and the filmation cartoon the vintage line was their first connection <sighs> ever since then all you've had is targeted uh, uh campaigns toys whatever for the fans um i mean look i mean look at the way mass um revel revelation and cgi cartoon were advertised revelation for the fans Mm -hmm. CGI cartoon for for the young up and comers, the kids. You know, let's get a new. And again, it's one of those things where I don't think, from what I've read, it's the CGI cartoon connected as well as Mattel would hope. And I don't think we have got another generation of He-Man fans behind us. I mean, it's it's a shame, but, and I, I think the other danger is, like I say, is pop culture now is such an ever-changing beast. You know, kids grow up. This sounds like an old man rant now, but <laughs> but kids grow up. You know, we grew up watching TV. You know, after school, before school, whatever, playing with toys. You know, the best we had was like an Atari twenty six hundred, or you know, later on, I had like an Amstrad, then an Amiga, or the consoles, Nintendo, Sega Mega Drive, or Genesis, whatever. Mm -hmm. That's what we had as entertainment. Now, like. I very much doubt you get kids going, oh, after school, I'm going to go and watch He-Man. And then going to school the following day, 
that was the beauty of like especially in the uk you know he-man was shown once a week sporadically for all those years whatever cartoons you'd go in the following day to school and be like oh my god did you watch he-man last night you know it was so so many strong memories of that as well just so fun i don't think you have a generation of kids now doing that because streaming platforms the way media is consumed it's so very different and i think with that there is a lack of i think you've seen it a lot over the last few years especially there is that lack of commitment to because the way cartoons are made now because they have story arcs they kind of limit what you can be as a fan I'll, I'll try to explain this without sounding like horrid, but <laughs> with with the eighties cartoons, right? Nine, actually nine point nine shows out of ten was episodic, and it could go on for another season or two. Mm -hmm. So the possibilities were endless. Even the two thousand and two cartoon had that, where it was like it was a story arc, it was episodic, but there was still more to come. You felt like, well, there definitely was. When you look at modern cartoons, when you look at Revelation, it's, and, and I'm, I'm, I assume with Revelation, I know I shouldn't assume, but I'm going to do, story starts, story ends, story starts, story ends, the end. And it's like, well, then what can I, and I understand why they're done like that. Hell, I, if I was given that structure, I would do the same thing. But as, as fans, what can you, you can't watch Revelation and go, oh, there's, there's not much to talk about. It's a short series. You can't spin off your own ideas and be like, oh, what about this? And what about... Unless that's a lack of imagination on my part. With the original series, New Adventures 2002, there's all this wealth of, oh, what if this? What if that? That character, this character. Because, I mean, obviously there were those shows, there were so much of them. And I think you see it with like so many shows online these days with the binge watching. It's, it's consume, consume, consume. I've, I've watched shows where I'm like, did I watch season three of that? Like, I love Cobra Kai. <laughs> Ask me what happened in season three. I'll be like, which one was that again? You know, it's, but I, I love that series. I, I watched series one when it came out. I watched series two. I watched series three, four, and five, whatever we're up to. But that's my point. Like, compared to back in the day where you'd have, like, a season once a week or whatever, now you just kind of do it all in one chunk. Mm -hmm. And then within a week you're like what was that thing about you know i i think that's that's just modern like i say modern media consumption and it's just it's just the way the beast is i think and i think yeah. that's the problem about creating fans of anything i think you get something like the mcu which is very unique because they they were so it was so at the right time you know, it came along when films were like crying out for something new. The industry was crying out for something new. Iron Man happened, and then for the next twelve years, 10, 12 years, we had we had it really good. So, yeah. oh my god, I'm going to see Thor on the big screen. This is crazy. And then, yeah, I just you know, but the facts are like, for example, the comic industry hasn't improved, has it? The comic no. industry is in its worst place ever because kids aren't buying comics and i think understandably marvel were like well movies are doing well so now the comics will and it's like oh no it doesn't work like that and i think in reverse the same happens with he-man you can go well the toys are selling mainly to collectors mm -hmm. surely a movie's going to do well i don't think so i just think i think it's kind of missed the boat as it were yeah um, i don't want to be like burden of bearer of bad news or anything like i i hope i'm proven wrong sure, sure, I, sure. I want a movie to come out <laughs> i i don't it's you know it's not going to be written to appeal to me nor should it just make a he-man movie if it's good i'll watch it or i'll watch it and determine whether it's good or bad but i'd love it to succeed like all you ever want is for the for the brand to go on after you and i think mm -hmm. like you know i look at all the people that worked on the cartoons, the toy lines, your Mark Taylors, your Al Callows, Lou Shimers, Larry Dottilio's, all these great names, all these powerhouses of creativity that worked on this He-Man and She-Ra franchise that we love so much. And it's like, you know, when they were doing it at the time, they weren't thinking this is going to live 20 right. years, you know, after our passing or whatever. But it, it is, it's, it's living on after these people have passed away. 
and you just you can only hope that's what happens to us is like when we're long gone people are still talking about he-man and she-ra it's just um, I, I, don't, I don't know if that's i don't know if i'm coming off as like negative but yeah i just no i think it's know. a realistic approach to to it i mean we already understand that it is you know it, it like you said it is part of pop culture but it is still mm -hmm. fairly it's not as well known as other properties are <laughs> and the main reason it is well known is because the fans that were there at the beginning were still here giving it life right yeah and so it's hard it's hard to evolve beyond that and you know i make the joke that i'll believe there's a new he-man movie coming out when i'm watching the end credits scroll. <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> you know? that's brilliant that is it um, yeah i've always said set photo but that's that's even better yeah that's it <laughs> Yeah, I won't believe until I've seen the credits. It's, it's so true, though. It's I mean, so I mean, true. there's been so many false starts. You know, I've got my hopes up before it gets to the point where, well, I've got to manage my expectations now. You and got a guy on TV was... that no, no, what's his name? Noah, like on TV saying, "Yeah, I'm playing Hey Man on all these talk shows," and it's like, yeah, "Oh, wow, yeah. this seems to be going somewhere." Mm -hmm. Gone. Well, and now he's so not even attached got, to it anymore. We, yeah, we've got a director. What's oh, that's gone as well. You know, and it's mm -hmm. just, I, you just like you yeah just i'm not i'm never going to get hyped about it. it's not because i'm you know uh despondent or anything about it it's just because we've been here before and you manage your expectations simple mm -hmm. as that like you said it's just there's no point going oh my god because also the other thing is like i say if they make a movie it's not going to be at some point in the movie it's not going to be what any of us want the <laughs> savage the savage fans those those sometimes dedicated savage fans as in like not sometimes dedicated as in very dedicated savage fans that will be like why is he-man not killing things then you've got you may filmation fans it's like i don't want he-man to kill anything i think he's a man who's got all this power but it's tempered by wisdom right but it's not going to be that he-man then you've got like the 2002 is like i want like crazy action that's not going to be that you want master versus like, i want this kind of revelation that's you know you have all these different things and it's it's never going to be what you want like you even look at those Transformer movies. I was so excited when they, they were making a Transformers movie. The most excited I've got in any of those, I mean, I watched the first two and then I couldn't watch any more, which is crazy. If you'd gone back to James E. Tuck in like 1985 and said, there's going to be a Transformers movie. I'd be like, well, we got the animated one, but it's going to be a, you know, a bit like, oh, why in the future there's going to be five Transformer movies? That's amazing. Um, the only one I've, I've ever really, I think, enjoyed was Bumblebee because I think that was like a really well-told tale. I, I, from what I understand, it's pretty the well-received. And then you see the trailer for the latest one. It's like, oh, it looks like we're going back to Michael Bay kind of. <laughs> sure. But you know, I always but make the that's argument. That's the reality of it. Like I couldn't. I mean, I loved the Dinobots growing up. I couldn't even. Yeah bring myself to watch the movie that has Grimlock in it. Yeah, exactly. Likewise. Yeah. It's like, I loved, you know, me, Grimlock and all that. And yeah. oh my God, it's going to be so, oh, no, no, we're not, uh, we're not going to get to see that. It's just, yeah, I, I, um, I, I just think like those, those, those transform movies are just, uh, just so crazy, but I always make the argument. It's like, you know, why do they keep making them? Have you seen the box office returns of these movies? Whole, there's I a mean, reason they keep making it it's reason, like yeah. as a as a business person you'd be very stupid not to make a trend even if you're pissing off the fan base it's like we just cleared like 1.5 billion on that transformers movie want to make another one yeah sure what's the plot robots fighting robots good job let's do it there's that there's that there's that uh that epic rap battle video where they bring oh, in, right. they do it about all all these different directors and it's like stanley kubrick and steven Spielberg oh, and at the very end they bring in uh, michael bay and like his whole thing is like, no, I make effing money, you know. <laughs> he's like, yeah. explosions, and he's like, no, I know what I'm doing. I might be pissing everybody off, and you can say that I'm not a filmmaker, but I'm outselling all of you combined. Is you know? that, that's always the case, isn't it? Isn't that funny? It's like you know, I guess it's is what we we're going back to about earlier about YouTube. It's like I I should be doing the Michael Bay and just kind of <laughs> doing that exploitative titles and thumbnails right, and being like, right. you won't believe what happens to He-Man in this video. And someone watches, it's just like me talking about He-Man. But it's like, now I kind of, I want to, I want to be considered the Stanley Kubrick of uh, He-Man YouTube <laughs> video making. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I will somehow. Um, I'll just be, yeah, I'll be chased around amazed by uh, someone wielding an axe, probably as, as good well, as it gets. You'll, you'll know you've made it when we connect your, your YouTube channel with uh, the hoax of the moon landing. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, and I think I think another thing, you know, my one of my favorite aspects of of He Man, and and this goes way back to when I was 
you know, five years old watching the cartoon, I had this massive crush on Tila. <laughs> on that, I mean, it extended into my adult life. Like I, I met my wife and she was an athlete and she was very strong willed and independent. Oh, wow. And very, very impressive woman, you know, and I shared with her, I was like, yeah, you know, part of why, you know, I'm attracted to you because I've always been attracted to that type of woman. And that's who you, you know, emulate. That's who I'm reminded of. And she we ended up having He-Man and Tila action figures on top of our wedding cake. Oh, how so, awesome. <laughs> you know, it was just a cute moment to the point where now, you know, it's a our part of our love language is that she's my Tila kind of thing. Oh, you know, so I've, I've always had that. I've always appreciated that aspect of, of He-Man and Tila is their, their romantic interest in each other. And so in terms of anything new coming out, I'm getting older. I'd like to see He-Man and Tila together on screen at some point before I go, you know, I, we've had it in the comics and stuff like that. So I, I, I guess that's kind of my threshold for if I'm going to enjoy new He-Man content, you know, no, if they I can get, get He-Man and Tila together, if I can finally see that, that aspect fulfilled, I feel like I've been waiting 40 years for it, you know? So. The, clo the closest, obviously, we got, to, we got to that in the cartoon was at the end of the problem with power when he managed right. to off with Tina Sunset. When mm -hmm. I, I kind of created the, the 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 most frustrating thing ever though, where it's when we were doing the BCI DVDs. What part of the thing was they said, can you eliminate any continuity errors? I was like, yeah, sure. So you swap the Orko uncle episodes around because episode twenty three is the return of Orko's uncle, and episode twenty seven is. Orko's favorite uncle, so you have to swap them so they're in the correct order. And there are a couple others. Uh, yeah, Modulok, he like appears before his origin story, so you swap those two around and you have to swap another two because of that. One of the things I kind of did because I was like, oh, I want to see the happily ever after was I made the problem with power the last episode, and now everybody thinks that is the last episode. He's like, no, no, I just I just made that, and honestly, I think I I think even the Blu-ray release has that as the last episode. And I was like, oh, shit. I created that. Like, <laughs> that, I mean, it's, it is, don't get me wrong, I love the problem. It's with a good Paris, capstone. But, yeah, it's, it's, it ends that kind of thing. He-Man and Tila walking off into the sunset. The end. It's like, yeah. it's, it's a great end to that, that, that story. But, um, yeah, no, I, I, that's, um, that's a really sweet story of you, you like, meeting your wife and stuff. Like, I never, mm -hmm. I, as a kid, I never really had the crush on Tila. But then I remember... <laughs> One of the weirdest things going to the San Diego Comic Con in two thousand and six, and I got the. I think you've been to the San Diego Comic Con. I, I've never been. I've never had that. I mean, I, I went. Yeah, I went when it was probably less crazy than it is these days. But when I went in two thousand and uh, five and six, like I say with the BCI thing, on the I think it was on the last day or yeah, like on it was yeah Wednesday preview night, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I think it was on the Saturday. I went down Artist Alley. So Artist Alley were, were all the, you know, purple cloak um, uh, curtain things and the artists, all these like famous people, but just like dedicated Artist Alley. And I didn't realize I was a fan of Taylor until, I mean, I always liked the character, don't get me wrong. Didn't re realize I was a fan of Taylor until I, I came away from that convention and, and realized, oh my God, I, I, I printed out a Taylor model sheet and I had like 20 different artists interpret taylor so i've got these amazing sketches by like adam hughes um dan parent who's like an archie adventures guy um so many different but like all taylor all like you know filmation cartoon model but you know in these all different artistic styles yeah, and i'm yeah. like oh i really do like that character and like some of my favorite animation cells are of taylor i've got the infamous i've got the two key frames of the infamous butt jumping into shot sequence <laughs> i've got like right the butt one and then the the actual kind of pan and the top half of it. it's just like how did i well i know i had ended up with i was in the bloody warehouse <laughs> but yeah i mean that was the other thing like i you know i say i went to lou shiner's house one of the other things i was blessed with was when i went to visit my friend uh, lee in america in 2001 he like i say he was friends with lou shimer and he'd he'd gained access to the filmation warehouse which was just this warehouse you know filmation were, were had gone out, were gone out, were been shut down in eighty nine. So this warehouse was just where all the animation had been stored. It was just owned by this animation. Um, well, he's more like an art dealer called uh, Herman Rush, and he had like a few guys working at this warehouse, and they just they couldn't figure out how to sell this artwork. They were they were pricing up for like three hundred dollars a piece. 
the old they had a company called Sunday Funnies, and the old website had like a bunch of sales on. And bear in mind, like the late nineties, it was so hard to buy animation art from the shows, near impossible. You were very lucky. I stumbled upon my first piece in. 97 i was like oh my god oh my god i had a piece of it was just so now it's like i can't get rid of the shit right <laughs> he says putting up ebay sales but you know what i mean it's just i accumulated so much stuff like because when i worked for the on the youtube channel it's just like they just kept giving me shit and i was just like oh my god there's so much stuff now um but yeah going into that warehouse was amazing because it was just like these boxes hadn't been opened and there was like lee had already got me a you know, he'd, he'd messaged me and said, I can get you some sales. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure you can. You know, just another another jabroni online telling me. <laughs> to get. And it was just like, oh, no, you actually got me sales from the problem with power at Sweet Bee's home. So I, um, when I went over to see him, we went to the warehouse. And it was just, I mean, it was like, I always describe it as like a smaller version of the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, where you're just walking down uh, this it's a huge warehouse, but you're just walking down, cor uh, not corridor, but just like aisle after aisle of, of just random, not random, boxes upon boxes of filmation, you know, episodes of He-Man, Brave Star. But the He-Man stuff was amazing. It was usually like three boxes per episode because people always think, oh, you use so much stock. And it was like, they use stock animation, but you have no idea how much new animation was created per episode. Even when you think it's stock, most of the time it's not. It's really frustrating. <laughs> so I remember like really wanting the final image of House of Shikoti Part 1, which is... The shot of Shakoti's temple and like her face is glowing, and it was yeah, always because yeah. well, as a kid, I'd seen that episode and that end image scared the hell out of me because it was oh, like sure. to be continued. And I remember being like, and I didn't see that episode until like the American guy sent me over the tape in '96. So that image had always haunted me, and I, I, I later, you know, when I was doing my research in the early '90s, I figured out, oh, it's the House of Shakoti episode, and then I eventually got to see the episode for the first time in a long time. And when I was in the warehouse, I was just like, I need to get. So you go through, you, you know, you find MU40, House of Shikoti. So you start going through it. And all the folders were in episode order, all the sequences back then. It's just like, right. It's like, no, right, next box. And you like, right, it's going to be at the end. And then I got to the end of that box. And I was like, oh, my God, it's not in there. Someone's taken it. And then I pulled down MU41, which is House of Shikoti Part 2. And the first folder was the end of the previous box. And I was just like, oh, I've got it. It was like, to be yeah. continued. I was like, I've got the Shikoti cell. I was so happy, so bloody happy. It was, um, yeah, one of those moments where you're just like, oh, God, I finally I finally got that. I mean, I said, you know, that was one of the early early days of collecting. You used to go to that warehouse. And there's so much stuff in there, like all the original rotoscopes and Stuff that's probably just got lost now, unfortunately, where the, sure. that collection was so misused. Because um, I went to the warehouse a few times in Los Angeles. Then it moved to San Diego, where it was like the, the owner was selling so much of it, like dirt cheap, which is fair enough. But he was do he had some really um, thing, and he knew I didn't agree with it. But he would get like a beautiful pan background and just chop it up so he could sell it. And I was just like, oh, I'm no. like you're literally destroying artwork. Yeah. But my my friend Lee had. Uh, pretty much secured all the really cool filmation. Like he's got the he's got the Castle Grey Skull shot, the upshot. He's oh, got wow. all pans. He's got the snake, the Snake Mountain pan, the Snake Mountain um, interior, the throne room pan as well. All that stuff's just like phenomenal to look at. But yeah, like the you know, like I said to you earlier, it's like one of the things I've always found fascinating is after all these years discovering stuff, but also just you know. Uh, I think it was like 2015, 2016, a bit later. Some guy in the UK, like I've known for years, and I knew he had this cell, but he's like, I'm thinking of selling the I Have the Power cell that I've got. And I was like, oh, my God, you're going to sell it. He's like, do you want it? I was like, how much? And he told me, and I was like, oh, God. But I, was like, <laughs> I, I just, and I remember we, we because he, like I say, he lived in the UK, so we met uh, kind of like in Zone 6 in London. I was living in central London, and so I met in Zone 6. And we met in a coffee shop and he like gave me the cell and I was like, it was all like packaged and stuff. And it was really, really, really lovely guy. And I got back and I remember thinking to myself like, bloody hell, that was a lot of money. And I was like, is it going to be worth it? And the moment I took it out, I was just like, yep, that was worth it. <laughs> I, I own like, it's not, it's not the cell, but it's the cell, which is a, there's two key frames, which is where he's holding the sword like that. And the one where he's pushing it down. Right, I've got right. the, the pushing down one. I was just like, yep, that's, uh, that's, the one. that's pretty much it. I can get it out if you want. It's just there. Yeah. 
I'll, I'll just grab it. Give me like about uh, 20 seconds, I'm going to estimate. Okay. Okay, it's somewhere. Nope. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, there we go. Obviously, you know, I don't know if it's going to show up annoyingly because of the light, but I've got like the original oh, yeah. title cells. Oh, wow. So, oh, God. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful. So that's that. And then this is the actual original line art of the. Um, of that's the original line art of the logo so they actually that's all like hand drawn with rulers obviously sure, but sure. it's crazy you think this would have just been a xerox from like a license guide or something yeah, but it was actually yeah. like newly created on the back my favorite is the uh, instructions of what the logo is going to do <laughs> that's, oh, like, that's awesome that comes in the, the show so direction. that says yeah says oh this is there's like four drawings in there this is drawing d and it says and join with stationary he-man so it's like yeah and then that's awesome. like I've, I've got like a bunch of cells in there from the introduction but then this was the this was the one that i have the power wow i was just like when i got that i was <laughs> like i even filmed like you know filmed as i as i pulled it out I was just like oh my god it is just yeah a gorgeous piece it's so nice and like oh, i said it's the key frame so obviously in the in the show it was usually framed like that kind of thing yeah oh, yeah it's just it was like that was on the on the back this was like the most random find someone he used to work in the filmation sales department. He said, I've got a bunch of art, like I've got a box full of old stuff if you want it. I was like, yeah, sure. It's like, I paid $500, but the amount of stuff that was in there was phenomenal. But one of my favorite things was, there's this somewhat famous, I don't think it does the rounds anymore. It was a promotional image of He-Man that did the rounds, especially in the 80s, of him doing Eye of the Power and had like the lightning around him. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was in the sticker album, the Panini sticker album, you can see he's, he's Eye of the Power and he's in front of like the gray skull, um, bone bridge that weird structure okay but like randomly in there was in, in this collection stuff was like the, the actual effects artwork oh, for it. oh wow i was like how random is that so it's actually oh, I mean, it's, cool. an, it's an effect cell but i don't think i don't think this was used in the transformation because the funny thing about the transformation sequence is that we only discovered when working on the return of faker is originally when he-man pulls the sword down does i have the power the lightning was supposed to be over the sword okay but, but what you see in the episode is they obviously decided at some point we'll just place the frames over the lightning so in other words this would have originally in the when they were going to film the sequence this would have been on top of everything but if you look at the episodes when you watch the transformation sequence these cells are still used but the cell you know the the he-man cell is over the top of it so you lose this i mean this they do use these in uh, Temple of the Sun, that actually has the episode that I infamously recorded over Star Wars. Um, you actually see these cells being used, but yeah, okay. it's, it's, a, it's a really nice, like lots of detail there as well. Yeah, that is neat. But like I said, that was just randomly in this in this box of artwork, and I was just like, oh my god, it's a, it's a promotional um, yeah. FX image. But yeah, I've got like those are from my my box. I've got like three boxes of keepers. I say that it's like I probably will sell them at some point, but. You know, I'll probably take Eye of the Power to my grave. It'll be like buried sure, with sure. me. <laughs> Especially what I That's paid awesome. for it. <laughs> just, or, or sell it and pay for my coffin. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Oh, how fun. Yeah, I, I, that's another thing like, I kept thinking about for the YouTube channel. I was like, I should do like a video, not like a shoddly as showing off like that, but I should sure, do like sure. a presentation of, oh, here's some animation that I own. I thought like, yeah, people might get a kick out of it. No, I think so. People like toy room tours and stuff like that. I yeah, think. yeah. You get a lot of videos, obviously. Here's my toy collection, which is always really cool to see, and especially like mm. some of the displays that He-Man fans have these days. It's like, oh, yeah, they do nuts. some amazing like, things. Yeah. Room with lights and stuff. It's yeah. like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, my display is on top of a bookcase where I've got a couple of the statues I worked on, um, as in did, I did the bios for. So they sent me those pop culture collectible statues. Okay. Yeah. So I did the bios for those. So they said, you can have them for free. And I was just like, give me a sorceress and a tealer. So I put sorceress and tealer on my bookcase, as well as the filmation, uh, was it the Fil Super 7 Filmation Classics figures? So okay. the, the filmation accurate ones, but you know, yeah. But, and a couple of the Super 7 um, reaction figures. I've got all the trap jaws and I think all the skeletors. Yeah. Just like, it's just random things I like. Cause I, I, I recently sold a lot of my classics figures, like literally a couple of weeks ago 
much as I, I, I love those figures, but it was that thing of they're just sitting under my bed in bubble wrap. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather them go to a good home of like a collector that's like, oh my God, like I need, you know, a plunder or a man at sure, arms or sure. something. And it's, and by all accounts, they have gone to good homes. It's like, that's good. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's what I wanted rather than just sitting under my bed. And yeah. you could make the same argument with like a He Man cell that sits in a box, but it's like, no, that's, that's my baby. Yeah, that's yours. <laughs> <laughs> I get that out and look at it every every once in a while. Ooh. <laughs> but, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, I guess before we go, do you have any do you have any favorite characters? Uh, with with little hesitation, uh, Trapjaw. I've always loved okay. Trapjaw. Like loved the figure, loved loved him in the cartoon, voiced by Lou Scheimer. Um, I don't know what it was about that voice and that kind of he he had like this kind of. I always love uh, talking about writing fantasy cartoons where you elevate the character so they don't sound like they're from Earth. But what mm -hmm. I love about Trapjaw, he sounds like a New York cabbie or something. You know <laughs> what I mean? He's got that yeah. kind of. There's just there's just like oh he's, he's growling a lot and like <laughs> there's just something about. And I love I love the way he looked in the cartoon where they kind of gave all that magenta to him. Um, the toy's great. I love the um, the mini comic version, the kind of lime skin version yeah, where he's yeah, like the, silver. Uh this guy yeah it's one of my favorites is that the origins one yeah this is the origins one yeah it's like one of the few origins toys I'll, i i think i'd buy it's just he's so i always love that design it's just so eye-catching you know? yeah it's just yeah. it's really cool because i love the fact there's that yeah because the one like yeah the reaction trap toys i've got on my shelf i've got toy version formation version mini comic version and that weird variant reaction version where he's like he's like he almost looks like um not cyberpunk, steampunk. He's like golden brown. Is yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. I got that. Someone's like kindly. Uh, I think did they sell it to me or sold it. To, I forget. I think so. Regardless, that's one of my like. I love that trap jewel, but the mini comic one. But yeah, trap jewel. One of my favorite characters. I, oh, you know, every character and everything they always kind of get wrong. I've always found with trap jewel they always seem to get him right. Like in, uh, I loved him in the two thousand and two cartoon. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't mind him in um, Revelation. I didn't see him in the CGI. Actually, I did see a bit of him in the CGI cartoon. But like I said, that cartoon, I didn't. I enjoyed that first season, but it didn't kind of connect with me enough. But yeah, I think Trapjaw is just like my favorite character. I think the, the problem with He Man, he's got the Superman syndrome, where it's just like sure. you can kind of do anything. So Formation injected all that, that that kind of somewhat kind of humor into his character. I love like you know the. The, the the savage versions like where he was just like i'm gonna smash things the tex era ones i kind of like that version um yeah just there's, there's so many characters to enjoy how about yourself what's your favorite character um just... i mean i've i've obviously i've always loved he-man i like prince yeah. Adam a lot just because you know as a kid you kind of relate to that character who has the potential to be something yeah. bigger than yeah. than who you are you know um i love i love tilo like i said Skeletor is a fantastic villain just because oh. I mean, he's, a, he's a skeleton man. I mean, I, know, thing, I, I, like, I like Triclops. I like, yeah, there's just, I mean, there's so many Cobra Con. I love, I've always loved Cobra Con because the toy. Um, I have three older sisters, and one of my sisters would always put Kool Aid inside Cobra Con and yeah. I'd walk around just squirting it in my mouth. Oh, that's genius. You know, I thought of it like that. <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, I, I always loved Cobra Khan because of that. Oh, that's great. You're, you're, I never thought of Cobra Khan as providing refreshment. <laughs> it didn't say that in his thing. Like, you know, the He-Man, most powerful man in the universe, Triclops, evil and sees everything. I didn't say, Cobra Khan <laughs> provides great refreshment. Evil that's refreshment. Right. <laughs> it, it's right there on the packaging. Yeah, evil master of refreshment. It's like, oh, that's good. <laughs> I was, thinking, I was thinking when you said you fill them with Kool Aid, I thought Kool Aid. I thought, oh, when you spray them, like, does it come out red and looks like blood? And, like, and then you <laughs> it, said, it, like, it it's like, it's refreshing. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> it, it's crazy when you think of like, I remember, again, going back to just the nostalgia thing. I remember when that last kind of wave came out. Again, walking into the toy store and seeing um, King Randor, uh, Clamp Champ, the Sorceress, and just thinking like, wow, this is still, you know, not still going, but I was just like, this is. My, I remember buying. Bought the sorceress because I love that obviously from the cartoon. Clench I didn't get first time around, I didn't get until later, but I love that figure. Um, just like even without his silly weapon, I didn't care too much right. for his weapon, it just looked like a bad. I know he's like you know, fist fisto armor, but there's just something really cool about that character. Um, 
But yeah, it was amazing. They're you know, like mosquito. That was a figure I got. That's a fun love. I got that for my after eighty seven. I would have got that for my no eighty eight. Eighty eight. I got that for my eleventh birthday because I remember I just left junior school. I was going to secondary school. And I remember just being obsessed with the blood pumping feature yeah, on mosquito, yeah, yeah. the vacuum thing or whatever it was. So so cool. But yeah, it's, you look back at that, and I think you know, kind of in answer to your early question, I guess maybe that's what makes it still ongoing. Is that there's that that those memories we have for the back brand. Like there's so much of who we are is connected to what that was. Mm -hmm. And what that still is, you know, I think, I think that's why, you know, and it's like any fan community, Star Wars, Transformers. I think that's why people take so many personal attacks and stuff. Like sure. if someone in insults filmation to me, I'm like, okay, cool. You know, if you don't like it, whatever. But I think so many people take certain things as a personal attack. And it's like, it's really not. That's, that's you having that, that connection that you're taking mm -hmm. it personally, but it's just someone's different. <laughs> I'm literally trying to preach difference of in the opinion on the internet. It's like, what am I doing? <laughs> Can't we just all get along, people? <laughs> yeah. No. yeah, I mean, it's fun. I mean, uh, I don't think I have any more questions for you, James. Uh, no, thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to waffle. Yeah. Yeah, for um, sure. This is this has been really great. Thanks, yeah, thanks no, for like, joining me. Yeah, um, nice. No, um, yeah, you have to. Who else have you got on the cards in the upcoming interviews? Um, I've got. Let's see here. I do possibly. I'm going to be talking with Ted Biaselli. Oh, um, Ted. Yeah. So that would be fun. He's he's always fun to talk to. I've talked with Tim Sheridan uh, regarding Revelation. I talked with Tim yeah. Seeley regarding the comics he's written. Um, I talked with the head writer, uh, Brian Q. Miller, who is the head writer for the CGI series. Oh, interesting. That, that was very informative. That was a lot of fun to talk with him. Um, I've talked with Yuka. He's, yeah, of course. Good old Yuka. He's, yeah. he's wonderful. Um, yeah, there's a there's a fan from Mexico. Her name is uh, Maria Dos Lunas. And we met through the Facebook groups and just kind of became quick friends but she writes a lot of fan fiction and and things like that and and so that was fun just talking you know from a fan perspective yeah. not necessarily a big well-known name creator but she actually helped me do a uh we did a really long video it was like two and a half hours long where we <laughs> jumped into the entire history of of he-man and tila's relationship and i put that video out for a valentine's day oh nice video. and that yeah. that was that was fun to do it was fun to go through all those sources and and find all the evidence. I can imagine, yeah. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. So no, I mean, it's just been a lot of fun talking with people who have some connection to the brand, you know, and people I, I know that, you know, I've, I follow on social media and I've watched, like I've, I've followed you since, you know, I first found you through your Serial Geek magazine. Oh, wow, yeah, yeah. You know, way back. Man, I was still in college when I when I stumbled across <laughs> quite a while back, yeah. Yeah, so you know, so it's just kind of fun, I guess. It, it's one of those instances where you know people like yourself, you know, kind of personal heroes to me because you've kept the brand relevant. God bless you. As is, you know, and so that's. No, so kind I always, of always, I'm, I'm always thankful when people say something as as kind as that. It's like because you know, it's. I'd also have a thankless task, but it's it's just something you do naturally. It's just like yeah. I've always loved He Man and Shira. I always love talking about it. I love exploring it. I love showcasing stuff about it. I just I'm always happy that you know people connect with it or enjoy it. You know, you get you know as the internet's got older, you get more and more you know Muppets come on, uh, sure. derogatory term <laughs> Muppets <laughs> come on and just like oh no no it's just like oh whatever. But I think you know it's always that thing. I'm sure you maybe the experience it with YouTube where you'll have like all these positive comments are just one negative one and you're yep. like and that's one that sticks with you right it's, but isn't that amazing and you hear like that happens to the most famous of people as well they'll have like movie reviews it's like your movie is a hit and then one person will say i didn't like it and you're like why you? mm -hmm. and it's just like you can't you know god you, you can't i, I learned that in therapy a few years back so like you can't make everyone happy and it's like that yeah. is true <laughs> it's just like some people are just not going to like you but um yeah if i if all i'm trying to do is just put good out there i'm glad that it's been enjoyed you know yeah. and um yeah it's i've never wanted to hoard stuff it's just i've always wanted to go hey look at this look at this enjoy this what's this 
Granamir in a wig. I want to get that still. There's, <laughs> there's a piece of there's a piece of artwork I saw years ago. Um, someone was selling a bunch of um, filmation kind of character sketches, and I guess one of the Granamir character designs was having a laugh, and there's like a male ver Granamir, and then a female version, and like a wig, and, is, and Granamir's saying, shake it, baby. And I was just like, oh my God, I want to own that. <laughs> like, all I've, all I've seen is like a crappy little sketch, and it's like, I want to own that, scan it, and turn it into an entire <laughs> epic video, breaking oh, down fantastic. Granamir and his lady, you know, his old lady or something. <laughs> the old ball and chain. <laughs> oh, that'd be so good. Like, explore Granamir's love life. It's like, I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> yeah. You never know what you're going to find. <laughs> yeah. That's, and like I say, that's the beauty of the He Man Shira um, world and community we live in because there's always, you know, more times than often, there's always something new, even if it's old, that comes along and you're like, oh, God, that, you know, that's there. So, yeah, um, long may that continue. That's what I say. Yeah. And I think it's always fun to have that that rush of nostalgia that you feel yeah. you know, jump, jump into these things. I mean, that's something that's always going to feel special. Yeah, absolutely. So. But yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining me. Like I said, this has been a real treat for me. Uh, just getting the opportunity to, to chat with you. I, I really do appreciate that. And oh, thank you for having me on. And um, yeah, I've enjoyed, like I say, waffling. Good. It's my speciality. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you let people know where, where they can find you? Oh yeah. I guess I was, I'm terrible at this part. I'm always oh, really I bad. Too. I always forget. It was, I'm just, I'm always like, I'm the world's worst. So when, when I used to take Serial Geek magazine around uh, com comic conventions, there were people would walk up and go like, oh, what's this? And I would just, I would honestly say, oh, it's just my magazine. My friend, she would say like, stop saying just your magazine because you make it sound so throwaway. You've got to sell mm -hmm. it to people. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess I should be doing that. We once, oh my God, there's a memory, he made connected memory. At San Diego Comic Con, I took Serial Geek there and Val Staples shared the table with me and we were sure serial geek was going to clean up and it did not it bombed massively because oh, no. san diego comic-con the last time i had been there 2006 between then and 2014 the mcu had happened so people were no longer going to buy comics and buy magazines and so they were going to see robert downey jr which i right. completely understand right. and chris <laughs> evans and all these guys that i totally understand so my magazine bombed but in the, on the last day as we were kind of like suffering um dean stefan the late dean stefan sadly um he uh the writer of the 2002 cartoon he, he'd been like kind of coming up to our booth like throughout the days and stuff a real real sweetheart and he was like he goes you guys are terrible at this he was always he had such a caustic tongue but it was always lovingly received just like oh man and he was just like right here's how you do it and he stood there for about I want to say 10 minutes and did like almost a salesman impression. He was like, okay, everybody come over and he things started selling. We were like, the hell, why did we, we should have just had him at our table the whole time. <laughs> He'd literally been walking around going like, I haven't got much to do. I just come every year. Just like, oh, we should have had Dean Stefan from day one pimping our stuff. But um, <laughs> yeah, I was just, I've always been a terrible salesperson as in, mm -hmm. you know, as I keep, I keep thinking recently, I need to do something more on Twitter, like maybe post, one video a link to one video a day with a thumbnail going check this out because if one person sees that one of those videos that's like 30 new views or something sure, maybe 30 sure. new subscribers so <laughs> but um yeah so uh, my instagram is <clears throat> what's my instagram serial geek breakfast cereal as in cereal geek or one word 77 because someone got serial geek before i did um yeah frustrating and then my youtube you can find it just by searching for serial geek tv and then you'll find okay. a youtube channel where i upload uh video essays and video commentaries yeah kind of every, well update weekly but commentaries one week video essays the next so yeah there's a lot of um a lot of content and yeah like i say, i'm aiming for a, you know 2025 is already being worked on so you've got to think there's still another couple of years in there <laughs> and years <laughs> in the tank so yeah we'll see sure well awesome um so i guess with that we'll go ahead and say say goodbye uh again i am dad at arms you can find me here on the dad at arms channel on youtube i'm also on instagram at dad at arms and on twitter at red pyramid nine but if you just search dad at arms it'll pop up as well um so yeah thanks for watching and thank you james for joining me it was a pleasure see you soon
I was going to do a peace sign. What am I doing? 